Greetings, my fellow Westorians. I'm Aziz. With me is Ashea. And this is Valar Reredis. A journey through the books for people who have made the journey before. Brought to you by people who have made the journey many times. George R. Martin has said before and will say it again. This series was designed to be reread. And we're your tour guides on this journey, but even we doing this full time, obsessing over everything, can't catch it all. And you guys help us out with that. If you're watching live, you can feel free to ask live questions or submit live comments and observations. You can also do that in advance of the episode, meaning ahead of time, by joining us on one of our social media outlets and submitting questions or discussion points that way through Facebook, where we already have each chapter posted by our excellent Facebook mods to discuss each chapter individually, uh, in, in also including excellent art work accompanying each one. We have a wonderful discussion community on Flick for mobile devices only. We have a new and burgeoning community going on Discord and on Slack. And of course, we have Patreon, which is the main financial way to support History of Westeros. Also check out the Isle of Faces podcast, uh, aptly named especially for this episode because we're actually discussing the Isle of Faces a bit today. That's Joe Buckley's podcast. His thoughts are in every episode of Valar Reredis. And you can catch him on, like I said, the Isle of Faces podcast. He calls the Valar Reredis editions Scraps and Scrolls. Also, check out Nina Friel's Tumblr. That's Good Queen Alley uh, with one L. And her thoughts are all over these episodes as well. A super chat right off the bat from Ainsley Michael John Griffiths. The cool apple gif, uh, gif rather. I always do that. Yeah, I was about <laughs> to yell at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, and we're underway. Today we have Daenerys 2, the one where they go to Astapor, a.k.a. the gang meets the Unsullied. Brand 2, story time. The tourney, of the tourney of Harrenhal, a.k.a. the gang meets a friendly little. Davos 3, the once and future hands share a cell, a.k.a. the one with Mel's lecture on duality. John 3, naked and a cave. AKA the one where John knows something. <laughs> and Daenerys 3, the gang burns some slavers, AKA the one where a dragon is no slave. Interestingly, I saw, I looked at, since we do these, our chapters and, and a lot of the preparation for Valar Reredis before each book is with a spreadsheet where we do all the chapter names and the, the audio book lengths and things like that. All the, all the, the mods for our Facebook group assign which of them is going to post the chapters. So I was looking at it, and you can, I can I noticed some patterns. And I thought I'd dig in a little deeper. Daenerys one to Daenerys two is exactly fifteen chapters apart. These two chapters, Daenerys two and Daenerys three, are four chapters apart. Daenerys three and Daenerys four are fifteen chapters apart again. Daenerys four to Daenerys five are fifteen chapters apart. <laughs> Daenerys five and Daenerys six are. Well, 14 chapters apart. So that seems very deliberate, spacing that very particularly. And of course, the reason these two are so close together is they're so directly related to each other with the whole business. And I mean business with the Unsullied. Now, there's some other themes here in, uh, present besides this chapter counting business that I just did. Um, one theme is what people will do for their own gain what people are willing to sacrifice to stay true to their convictions. The slavers of Astapor who exploit human suffering for profit versus the little who protects Bran and company against Ramsey's offer of reward. And of course, he's risking his own life by helping protect them as well. Alistair Florent, who tried to sell out Stannis to get Brightwater Keep back and perhaps his life, eh, which that really backfired, didn't it? Versus Davos, who is willing to die to stay loyal to Stannis, even if it means going down with the proverbial ship. That's part of what makes the Danny chapter so fun here. She appears to be making an extreme sacrifice while also going against her convictions by selling Drogon in exchange for the Unsullied. First time readers and Sir Barristan alike are fooled and then thrilled. Rereaders are not fooled. But a lot of us are still thrilled each time through. It's quite a moment. On top of all that, we have some structural themes here. Uh, in addition to the, the, the way the Danny chapters are spaced out, a lot of the chapters are laid out as having kind of two basic parts to them. For example, Davos 3 is 
mostly about Davos chatting with Mel than Davos chatting with Alistair Florian. Brand 2 is mostly about the friendly little than the tournament in Harrenhal story. That really helps us name these chapters, by the way. But <laughs> more importantly, it fits beautifully with the duality theme, which is particularly prominent in Davos's northern chapter, or Davos's chapter, it's not in the north, with Mel's lecture, that is. But also the comparison of the Fens to the south and the northern mountain clans to the free folk. It's kind of an inverse. And with Danny too, Danny gets Barristan's advice. It's not honorable to use slaves to win the throne. And Jorah's using the Unsullied is better than the bloodshed that she might otherwise have uh, incurred winning the throne. And uses both, making the Unsullied part of her army, but only after making them not slaves anymore. In other words, after freeing them. Right on. A couple more super chats. River Missoula, 777, because Valar Reedus is awesome. Thank you very much. And Tommy Pappas for making Sundays great again. 999. Nice uh, numerical symbology there or um, patterns there. Love it. Thanks, guys. And let's go. Daenerys 2, the one where they go to Astapor, a.k.a. the gang meets the Unsullied. A few of the Unsullied are Missandei's brothers. And, of course, we meet her here, too. We'll speak about her more later because it's really focused on the Unsullied. And there's plenty more times to talk about Masande. But almost as an afterthought, she's given over to Danny in the bargaining in the next chapter. And so it's a small kind of accident. But Masande becomes such an important character. Here's the opening line. In the center of the Plaza of Pride stood a red brick fountain whose water smelled of brimstone. And in the center of the fountain, a monstrous harpy made of hammered bronze. Bricks in the desert. That's hot. Not the good kind of hot. Brimstone, extreme heat, suffering, punishment, eternal and unrelenting. Men who shape their hair into horns. This place is hell. It's ironic that it ends up being defeated by something even hotter than hell, dragon flame, and intimidating as she is, and I don't mean Daenerys, I mean the Harpy, this this creature that it, you know, it, it, I don't know what to call it besides by name, but it's it's so strange, the Harpy. It, whatever it is, it's no match for the dragon, quote. Twenty feet tall, she reared. She had a woman's face with gilded hair, ivory eyes, and pointed ivory teeth. Water gushed yellow from her heavy breasts. But in place of arms, she had the wings of a bat or a dragon. Her legs were the legs of an eagle. And behind, she wore a scorpion's curled and venomous tail. The harpy of geese, Danny thought. Old geese had fallen 5,000 years ago, if she remembered true. Its legions shattered by the might of young Valyria. Its brick walls pulled down. Its streets and buildings turned to ash and cinder by dragon flame. Its very fields sown with salt sulfur and skulls that's kind of hard to say fast salt sulfur and skulls 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 oh, okay not as hard as i thought it's no uh irish wristwatch <laughs> you know i learned that irish wristwatch is actually supposed to be irish wristwatch swiss wristwatch oh really You're supposed to say them both oh that is harder <laughs> yes really though the harpy i mean that's their proud symbol i mean you could argue maybe dragons are no better than harpies but dragons are at least an actual part of Valyrian culture. I mean, they're real, which harpies are a myth, even in Essos, as far as we know. And if they aren't, well, ironically, it would be it likely would be the Valyrians who made them, <laughs> since they're the ones who are known for making new species, after all, and all that experimentation and blood magic. The Iskari didn't do any of that. The Iskari are more known for enslaving new species and old ones, so, of course, the Valyrians borrowed all that slavery expertise when they conquered them, too. And as Danny notes, the Harpy of Geese held a thunderbolt, but the Harpy of Astapor holds manacles. So they've really, really leaned into this slavery business, even more so than, well, more so than I've ever seen, really. This is a culture focused on the idea of completely eradicating hope, because hope is what fuels all insurrections, all revolts, all attempts at change or reform. When, uh, begin with hope, especially in, in circumstances that are, are well, kind of hopeless, but if they're not fully hopeless, hope remains. But this culture, well, thousands of years of practice of eradicating hope. They've been very successful at it. 
What is there to hope for in Slaver's Bay if you're a slave? An, a quick exit, an early death, the ho hopes for freedom is really, I mean, it's not, a hope is never terribly reasonable, o often isn't terribly reasonable, but it's, it's almost literally impossible here. There's nowhere to escape to. I mean, you get away from Astapor, and where do you go? There's nowhere to go. Everyone around is a slaver, everyone around is allied or bought by the slavers, or they're murderers like the Dothraki, or something like that. There's just... It's awful. It's not just bad inside the city. It's bad in the surrounding region. And these good masters have been ruthlessly for eons honing in on exactly what can go wrong for a slave owner. And they have all this practice at imposing solutions and, and cutting off hope and options and oh, just holding it all on lockdown. They have thousands of years of collected knowledge on how to deal with insurrections they know how to see the signs. They know how to stop them before they even get the slightest bit of momentum. To accomplish this, they have wealth accumulated over this same vast period of time, and they work together to keep the system in place. Think about that. That's like the one thing they work together on, a culture that works together on slavery and not much else. Ugh. And the slaves, that's what they're up against. They're up against this extremely powerful united front that's collected knowledge and experience over the eons whereas every slave revolt every slave individual is starting from scratch in terms of trying to come up with some way to maybe escape this and of course the roads are all closed to that option there is no hope until daenerys consider the concept of forbidden knowledge in fantasy settings it is generally something like necromancy black magic blood magic maybe more appropriate for this setting but the general concept is that it's unthinkable that which is better left unknown a phrase like the peaceful people make the best slaves to me that's forbidden knowledge that's the kind of thing no one should know no one should have figured that out we desperately hope euron doesn't destroy the citadel that Westeros avoids a dark age by conserving its collected knowledge, but which races make the best slaves? That book should burn and never be rewritten. The trouble is it's not in the books. It's in these families. It's these slaver families that pass down the knowledge word of mouth. I mean, I, I probably wrote some of it down, but mostly it's in their heads, or at least a lot of it is. So I guess... You got to burn them too. the people that have that knowledge that aren't reforming. I mean, it's a big decision for Daenerys, but it's the gears are turning through this chapter. And, it, and it, it, her decision comes either at the end of the chapter or in, during the next one. It's not clear exactly when she decides what she has to do because of the way that the chapters are written. It's, it's concealed from the reader what, she, what her plan is. But we know. And let's not forget Quentin Martell also goes to Astapor as a member of the Windblown, and his thoughts, they have a lot in common with uh, some of these other ideas. Quote, Frog would be glad to put Astapor... Frog would be glad to put Astapor behind him. The Red City was the closest thing to hell he ever hoped to know. The depths of this kind of evil is beyond our understanding. But it's real for Daenerys. She's there right in front of it, facing it in person. Like George R. R. Martin does with a lot of fantasy concepts, he takes something real dials it up like he takes I mean, the concept of Hadrian's wall turns it into the wall of 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 the of Westeros the big giant 700 foot thing he's tried to imagine the worst slavers of all time on earth and imagined ways somehow to make them worse because you're already starting with some of the worst people of all time but the best way to make them worse is to up the scale make the numbers bigger make the culture older so the evils have been lasting longer give them characterizations that accompany all the depth of of darkness and evil. There are a lot of references to Astapor being hell. Even the guardsmen. I mean, check this out. Quote. Bareheaded, each man had teased and oiled and twisted his stiff red-black hair into some fantastic shape, horns and wings and blades, and even grasping hands. So they looked like some troop of demons escaped from the seventh hell. Yeah, it's not exactly subtle. Like, he just flat out calls it hell. <laughs> Quentin Martell calls it hell. Here we have demons escape from the seventh hell. Brimstone. It's just all over the place, right? But what's, it, it really gets me, though. Most cities in the modern world, they're really geared towards 
being appealing, right? They, 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 they want to encourage wealth or immigration or investment, tourism, things like that. <laughs> but this city is every it's designed to intimidate slaves. I mean, it's like their architecture is built for the slaves, but not for them against them. It's, yeah, I, I imagine though that it would still appeal to the slavers. Oh yeah, you know, certainly. Like they would still be like, "Oh, what a what a feat of engineering! <laughs> Your hair is fantastic. What stylist did you go to?" <laughs> and it gives them this sense of comfort, like, "How could any slave ever break free of this?" <laughs> you know, like we've really got them locked down. Aren't we great? Ugh, this is so it's incredible. Remember what I said about Tywin last episode? How he barely perceives the insult and in being called ruthless or cruel or evil. He's like. Okay, what is, you know, fine. But call him weak or mock him or act like you're not beneath him. That's that's when he gets upset. And that's very similar here with these slavers. Krasnys Monaklas is, this guy is just a, relentlessly insulting. He just can't help himself. And it's just, he has no self-control because he's just an angry person that, has no good in his life. His, he's, he's all about slaking his desires and not, there's no fulfillment in a life of slavery. There's just, you know, fancy drinks and, and food and just satisfying your lust. It's really not a, a good life. Uh, but, you know, I'm not trying to feel sorry for him, but still, <laughs> you, see, you, you can't look at this guy and think, that's what I want to be. I want to have a personality like that. You know, he, he doesn't seem to be enjoying himself. I like that you're clarifying you are not a slaver apologist. <laughs> yeah, that's really necessary, isn't it? It's like, hmm, I can't tell what side of East is on here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, his, his greed and arrogance outweigh his brutishness and his wealth is astounding. As Jorah points out, they don't have enemies, not even each other. Like, completely free of fear and responsibility and just filled with wealth and privilege that it's it's hard to fathom just how deep this runs and they don't go to war with each other because it's bad for business even they as corrupt as they are are focused on that bottom line of wealth so like i said the one thing they've come together for is slavery and they really come together in astapor specifically in making the unsullied this is their great public project the cultural achievement of the Astapori nobility is the perfectly obedient and unfeeling killer. That's their great achievement. Wow. The good must masters had a house motto, it would be, yeah, we're slavers. And their sigil would be the harpy with the manacles, of course. And it would be shrugging. It'd be like, yep, that is, that's what we do. So, gosh, why would I think of Tywin in a place ruled by ruthless greed where the literal first sentence we see describing the place includes the so-called Plaza of Pride? <laughs> Slaver's Bay is, is like if variations of Tywin Lannister ruled a place for several thousand years in a row. You might say, oh, but slavery is illegal in Westeros and against tradition for thousands of years. Well, I do believe we've covered extensively that Tywin is not so big on upholding traditions and norms. He does what he can get away with, and what he can get away with is mostly by shoving it in people's faces and saying, what are you going to do about it? That's a lot that, that you could see how that would eventually lead to slavery or something like it. I'm not saying he would implement slavery or even he would want to, just that he'd not bat an eye at the morality of it, except for political purposes, you know, because the seven are against that sort of thing and he doesn't want to make an enemy of the faith, you know, politics. Cersei, that's another story, making an enemy of the faith, but we'll talk about that some other time. This is another reason to mistrust the idea that Tywin's 20 years of peace as hand was was really that good of a thing. It's praised because it was peaceful, but that could be, probably is, if you ask me, an illusion. Especially given we know he undid Aegon V's pro-commoner reforms. A notable place that's very quiet and peaceful thanks to Tywin? Castamere. <laughs> Pray recall if you can, who said his preference was for... A peaceful land, a quiet people. Who said that line? Roos Bolton. <laughs> I prefer what the little said to Bran. We're getting ahead of ourselves with this quote. It's the next chapter, but it fits so well. So here we go. Quote. When there was a Stark in Winterfell, a maiden girl could walk the King's Road in her name day gown and still go unmolested, and travelers could find fire, bread, and salt at many an inn in Holdfast. That's an expression of safety instead of peace. There's a difference, a subtle difference between safety and peace, and there's a de um, even more, 
or less subtle difference between justice and quiet. Safety is peace that includes justice, and justice can be loud and messy, so you don't just assume that pe- that quiet means just. In fact, those who are treated unjustly should be loud, especially if they're being ignored. That's what kind of what they have to do. Being quiet, aka silent, about injustice isn't going to accomplish a damn thing. and It enforces the status quo. And the status quo at Slaver's Bay is about as bad as it gets. Build a plaza of pride if you can accomplish what the Starks have. If you can say a woman can walk in her name day gown carrying a basket of gold, no one molests her, that's something to be proud of, not a peaceful land to quiet people, <laughs> not without more context anyway. So this, this new plaza of pride that the Starks theoretically could build would not allow any harpies. I mean, Roose Bolton literally tears out tongues for just a minor provocation. That's, that's his version of quiet. That doesn't mean justice. That doesn't mean good. He tells Ramsey not to stop hunting girls in the woods, but to do it quietly. <laughs> Euron's crew, perfect example on his ship, The Silence is silent because they've literally been silenced, not because they have nothing to complain about, not because their needs have been met. (laughs) They're not like, oh, we have nothing to complain about. The best example, though, as much as I've gone to other chapters to find examples, is right here in this one. No notable war has come to Karth nor Slaver's Bay in eons, not not that we know of anyway. And Jorah explains in this chapter why the Kals leave it alone. As far as we know, there's been no notable slave rebellions either. So, pretty quiet and peaceful. But again, as I've just ranted about for a few minutes, that does not mean justice reigns. It does not mean basic human decency is observed. In, in Danny 3, she sees a man tortured so badly that at first she thought his skin was striped like a zorse, but he had been flayed. Eh, again, how can we not think of certain of the worst Westerosi figures when we see things like flaying and pride and just lack complete lack of human decency. Tywin and Roos wish they could have this level of absolute control. This is the type of godlike status they'd really love. It's a reminder, too, that efficiency is amoral. Because these slavers are efficient. The Nazis were efficient. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's the point, right? It's very easy to illustrate this. Efficient justice is good. Efficient slavery is bad. So... That's as extreme as a real-world example gets. Of course, when you bring up the Nazis, you're, you're going as far as you can. But the Mongols, I mean, they were really efficient, too, when, under Genghis Khan. But that doesn't mean it, they were good people. This is very much the case in the real world. George R. R. Martin clearly knows this. We've been, we're kind of mashing Danny 2 and 3 together a lot. We're, we're keeping some of it separate. But, you know, let's jump ahead one chapter here, her chapter, for another fitting quote. Some kings make themselves. Robert did. He was no true king, Danny said scornfully. He did no justice. Justice, that's what kings are for. It's easy to see how cruel this culture has become, but it's also very weak. Where even Tywin is better than the good masters is, is that if an outside invader came in, he'd step up. I mean, he'd likely be callous with the lives of the soldiers beneath him, and he'd be in minimal danger himself because he leads from the rear. But that's still a lot better than simply yelling, I'm sorry, defend us, while running away like these guys tried to do. Still, I, can, I think one can see how this in perpetuity for eons, this situation in Slaver's Bay, would lead to more and more indolence, more and more fear, and more and more just cruelty. Astapor's ruling class is just largely incapable of much besides these very basic things they're very good at and these awful things that they're very good at, really. And, of course, that makes them even more cruel. A whole life of nothing but slavering and luxury, no challenge, no self-improvement, no intellectual curiosity. Their treatment of other humans as worthless, as less than human, increases in proportion to how useless they are, right? The more their slaves have more abilities than they do, the more they look down on them. It's kind of weird. Note how the good masters argue over selling unfinished unsullied, but the ones who argue for maximum cash at maximum velocity win that debate. Shows you again where ultimately their priorities lay. Part of what makes them so useless is living this way for so long. Being detached like this, being above regular human needs and basics like war, 
it warps their perception of these things. They don't understand it anymore. Like it's built into their culture. Uh, the, the tokar is essentially the Roman toga, a garment designed for slavers. It literally required the wearer to, to kind of hold it on. It's a reverse display of power. Only a truly rich and powerful person can walk around in a garment that requires you to hold it. Because non-ultra rich people, you know, they need their hands to work and do stuff. But if you have a slave to hand you everything and literally like put food into your mouth for you, you, you can display, you can rub that in everyone's faces by having a weird garment. It's, it's very strange, but it happened in the real world. That's Roman togas for you. It's very similar. Now look, as far as the being ultra detached, the garment is one thing, but look at the ridiculous armies arrayed against Barristan, against Marine in A Dance with Dragons. I mean, you got soldiers on stilts. You got soldiers, you got slavers breeding tall slaves and, and, and it just really flat out silly. I mean, it is silly. And George has made it that way on purpose. Recall that Stannis and Davos, <laughs> they mock how ridiculous the lords of Westeros are with their regalia and their huge egos, most of them accomplishing little. This is that concept dialed up even farther. And that's what we see later with the Yunkish High Command when they besiege Meereen. A bunch of people who have been incredibly rich for so many generations that they're inextricably deep in a bubble of existence that doesn't allow for self-reflection or empathy. There's just they can't see that and they don't there's no one that they would listen to that would ever say that kind of stuff to them because their only their only peers are people who share all these attitudes they give each other unearned praise and accolades on the basis of extreme agency born entirely from extreme wealth not from achievement not from doing anything just from being born really rich into this system they'd be nothing without money yet somehow this money in their minds is what makes them superior yeah not that we needed more reason to hate slavers, but George piles on other things like eating puppies. I mean, <laughs> God, he calls, then they call people who eat beef savages, which, you know, most, uh, not most, but a large percentage of all people who read the Song of Ice and Fire novels eat and enjoy beef. Uh, there's plenty of vegetarians out there, you know, obviously nothing against y'all, but. And people in, eat dogs. And I mean, we judge them for it. Just it's that's like, pretty uncommon, though. Even in China, that's pretty uncommon. It's true. It's true, though. You're right. Is, there are people that do that. Yeah, you're right. And it's still eating meat. It is. It's, if you're eating pig, that's true. But it's certainly, I think, it's chosen specifically to uh, to disgust the largest number of readers and uh, certain because there's certainly way more dog lovers and dog owners than there are dog eaters. <laughs> and uh, same with the cows. <laughs> Although there are a few people who would agree with eating beef as being savage. <laughs> a lot of people, actually. Uh, anyway, the slavers, the slavers have grown ever crueler and weaker over a vast amount of time. Well, not readers of this series. You're right that that many people exist in the world like that, but they're not, they're not readers of this series, I don't think. I don't know. Anyways, that's not important, but I don't know. I like to think that I could a be lot wrong. of them are. It's a but huge I, population. It is, but they're not mostly not English-speaking. I'm... That's not. There's a lot, though. Anyways, this is not important at all. Yeah. But anyway, there are globalization for the win. <laughs> I believe one reason George makes Carth and Slavers Bay so awful is to make it less obvious that Westeros is pretty darn awful too, or at least make it seem vastly better by comparison. It's easy to say Slavers Bay is worse because, well, the slavery, obviously, and I agree. But the lives of Westerosi peasants are brutal and terrible too. It's the difference between having the freedom to go wherever you want versus not even having the means. I mean, there's freedom, but that's an illusion if you don't have the ability to capitalize on your own freedom. This is, could all lead to a philosophical debate, maybe kind of like the one Ashay and I were just having, <laughs> over what freedom means to someone in a state of abject, helpless poverty. Is starving in freedom better than being a well-treated slave? I don't know. I don't think that's something that for an, any individual to decide. I think it depends on who you ask. I think it's ultimately a matter of opinion. It's a tough question, though. Regardless, this is perhaps what Danny will see as well. Will she look upon Westeros as irredeemable, too? Will she see the same early signs in Westeros that are late signs in Karth and Slaver's Bay? Is she going to look at Westeros and see this is what it's going to be like later and I better stop that now? 
I mean, this is also the same kind of rot that consumed her ancestors' ancient home, the freehold of Valyria. So, mm, yeah. As for the Unsullied themselves, their training is reminiscent of the system for Spartan children called the Agoge. It was brutal and many died. There's the, your first similar comparison. And it included both physical and psychological extremes. So, there, again, of course, the huge reverse is that in Sparta, these were nobles and it, they were exclusively chosen. It was a great honor to enter the Agoge. Of course, there's no wine of courage or removal of genitalia as part of their training either, but the ultra discipline and obedience and the treating of other beings as lesser that they have in common. Some thoughts from Joe Buckley. Just like that, we're in Slaver's Bay, a central setting for Daenerys from here on until her final chapter of A Dance with Dragons. Uh, sort. Well, maybe not final chapter, but, you know, as soon as she flies off to, to the Dothraki Sea, which is mid-late A Dance with Dragons. Regardless, it's a great point because this is where she, it doesn't necessarily appear that she's going to be staying here that long on first read. She's like, come in, blow up the slavers, grab the Unsullied. You could see her just jetting from here pretty quickly. But of course, she definitely does not. And in fact, it becomes a new gathering point for a lot of other POVs. We got Tyrion, we got Barristan, we got Victorian, we got Quentin, plus non-POVs like Jorah and a lot of these sellsword companies and, and other whoever else may show up. And not to mention the maneuvering and, and finagling from afar by characters like Illyrio and Varus and all that. So, yeah, it doesn't it didn't seem like it would be such a long term thing, but we can see why it is. Because Danny doesn't want to just leave and cause all this destruction. She realizes how big a deal it is for her to to rule afterwards. You can't just blow up the system and leave. It doesn't work. We come to one of the more famous improvements of the show versus the books, the language trick. Not that we should hold this against the books. It's just a, you know, a power of the medium. They were, it was a, you know, what, what Joe is saying here is the trick of Danny not understanding the slavers was even more tricky on the show because the reader wasn't in on it. <laughs> the show, the show watchers are being fooled just like the slavers. So that's kind of neat. I, I could argue that isn't necessarily better, but it's different and good. You know, it's a matter of preference, I suppose. I appreciated the difference, though, for sure. Now, we've got some, some de as far as a lot of themes here, a lot of the themes t chiefly tying uh, that of the children, rather, being made to suffer and put to use for a war machine. That's a recurring thing all over the world, in the real world, as well as in Westeros, Essos, etc., and, and something, a question that we've asked occasionally is, what would Eddard Stark make of all this? We wonder how he would handle some of these situations, because so often he's considered a moral center. Flawed, but absolutely on the right track with a lot of things. So he's a good person to think of when we're confronted with moral conundrums. Not that Slaver's Bay is a moral conundrum, but how to deal with it and how to act, you know, react to it. So Danny is a more of a mother figure in a lot of ways than than Eddard Stark is. So there's obviously a lot of differences in their personality, but still they would, you know, Eddard would clearly hate it, but what would he do? You know, that's that's a tough call. There's also a strong link to Varus here, not only because the Unsullied are mutilated in a similar way. I mean, they're mutilated even more in some ways, but they they're all they're all eunuchs, so that's obviously something they have in common. But in addition to what Varys himself does, the fallout of dead children is what Joe calls it, behind the scenes. You've got all these dead children implied with the creation of Unsullied, and quite a few dead children with Varys' machinations as well, with his little birds. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's... The front end of this looks a lot different than the creation. It's, yeah, very, very different. The little quote here, they may have been wild while you were gone, Khaleesi, Eri told her. Or they have been wild, not may have been. <laughs> That's talking about the dragons. Now, Joe points out that Danny's own emotions and horror have been going up and down while she's been witnessing the slaves. And maybe the emotional connection between her and the dragons is a little, is being represented here. That they, it might be that because she's gone and they just miss their mother, but it might be that they're sensing her moods and of course her moods are really extreme at the at the moment because she's faced with slaver's bay 
and this conundrum and how to handle this because she hasn't yet at this point fully decided what plan of action to take. She hasn't decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, swindle the slavers and, and take the unsullied and burn them all. She, I don't know that she's made that full plan come to, you know, fully form that plan yet. Joe also notes that this quote, look at the walls. You can see where they've begun to crumble there and there. Do you see any guards on those towers? I don't. It's a, a good hint that Danny is learning about strategy and war and noticing the signs of, of, well, just noticing what to look for. And it's funny to think of Mace Tyrell saying women don't have the stomach for war and <laughs> thinking about this chapter. Not only is she thinking about it in terms of war, but she does something that requires quite, quite a strong stomach. Jorah goes on to make this really awkward argument about the sack of King's Landing and how, well, the Unsullied won't do any raping or pillaging. Well, I mean, he's not wrong that they won't, but he's wrong in saying that this is the only army in the world that can behave that way. We literally have Stannis as an example of someone who, okay, so three of his men, apparently after the, the wall battle of the wall, were gelded for rape. But that's a guy doing, you know, that's justice. Of course, it maybe would have been better if it had never happened in the first place. But, well, definitely would have been better if it never happened in the first place. But the point is, Stannis' army is very disciplined, and there's no, he didn't have to cut their, their penises off in advance. He cut them off as a punishment. So I think even though Stannis' method lets a few slip through the cracks, it's clearly more just than... <clears throat> preemptively making eunuchs out of your soldiers because they some of them might turn into rapists much later that's that's not justice either so jorah is leaving out this important example of of a human doing you know human soldiers not modified not dehumanized just being led well just regular old human discipline regular old do this or else do that and you get punished. It's not that hard conceptually to understand. Some thoughts from Nina here. The Astapori boast of their descent from the great empire of geese, but in its an invented heritage, they've appropriated the symbolism of geese, the harpy, but twisted it to justify the slave trading economy they themselves took over after the destruction of Valyria. They claim to have recreated the lockstep legions of geese, but they compose the unsullied of brutalized slaves instead of free citizens. Like, how is that? How is that similar? <laughs> I mean, what Astapor is, in fact, is a rundown, smaller scale copy of slave dependent Valyria down to the bastard high Valyrian they speak, not a recreation of their ancient proud empire. I mean, every unsullied every 1000 unsullied that are made there's 2000 culled and a thousand infants and the dogs and the traumatized mothers and all that uh, and that is very similar to what we see in the mines of valyria so much death in those mines that's where the faceless men originated because it was so extreme and this is Remind, reminiscent of Valyrian steel swords. Valyrian steel swords apparently require human sacrifice to create. And that is even said here. Krasny's Molot Nakla says, tell her they are like Valyrian steel. And in fact, is that a little bit of a clue? Valyrian steel is probably going to be hugely useful against the others and the undead. And as we see in the TV show, the Unsullied will also be hugely valuable against the undead. Their uh, fearlessness, their discipline, which is the greatest we've ever seen, while facing such a ferociously uh, scary, terror terrorizing opponent, you could see where that discipline would come in handy. And again, that comparison to Valyrian Steel is, is even apter than... Apter? <laughs> is that a word? It is now. So though she's not interested yeah, in Jorah... after is more na more apt. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. What about more after? <laughs> well, I'm saying that to say after is more apt than to say oh, more apt. You're saying it's more, even higher on the scale. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> though she's not interested in Jorah as a man, his advances get her thinking about sex again. Eerie helps her out in the middle of the night and just falls right back asleep. <laughs> She's just like, yep, let me do that. 
Danny, though she sees herself as a child of destiny, still thinks of it as kind of a betrayal, you know, to to do this, to have pleasure with somebody else, which is kind of weird, but you kind of understand it from a human perspective. It's a stressful job being a prophesied hero. I mean, come on, Danny, you need to allow yourself to have a little fun from time to time. De-stress, girl. <laughs> so this chapter gives us a lot of work with in terms of thinking about Danny's climb, I mean, end game. <laughs> She's confronted with a lot of uncomfortable realities, like bad jokes. The idea of the Unsullied is utterly horrifying to her, but as Jorah says, that horror is in the past. Their future can be a force for good. This is a part of why Danny is so frustrated with Jorah. He put her in an impossible position. She knows she needs this men who are no longer men and can't allow them to go to someone else who might use them for awful things. It's like, now I know this thing exists. Now I have to deal with it. I, I'm... Because she has the kind of personality she has. She can't go allowing the Unsullied to be sold to some Corsair king that's mentioned here. Like, that could be Euron. And, again, they sure would fit his preferred mold of, cu of crew member. I almost said preferred mold of cucumber, I swear. Minus the complete lack of sailing skills. Imagine Euron looking at Astapor going, Nice. Hell. Ah, oh, this is great. This is what I want Westeros to be like. Danny can't use the Unsullied because invading Westeros with a slave army is terrible optics. As she points out, it is dishonorable to win a throne with gold. It's better to gain a following, to prove that people believe in you as a leader. But by the same token, she cannot allow this injustice to continue. It's why she thinks of Eroa here. That means taking these victims who are killers away from the evil place that made them in the first place. The minute she met the Unsullied was the minute she was committed to saving them. And that means using them after all. She does have to use them, even though she realizes how bad of an idea it is. She just has to bear the burden of those terrible optics, make the most of it. And terrible optics are going to pile up for Danny, uh, as we'll see down the road. Putting, so putting her in this spot was very manipulative for Jora because there was only one way it could go. She didn't truly have the freedom of choice here, given her convictions and bravery and skills. It's the proverbial offer she can't refuse. Yet it's also a deal with the devil, fittingly, in a place so reminiscent of hell, the place where devils make their home. Jorah just sees all this so much differently than she does. He doesn't care about justice or ethics or anything here, other than appealing to what Danny wants. He wants it to look, from her perspective, you know, just and, and good. But he doesn't quite understand how to do that. He's already resorted to slavery before, after all, right? Jorah cares about winning. He cares about getting home and winning her. That's not what she cares about. She's mad at Jorah because he brought her to hell to do business with the devil, and he thinks this is winning. How is this kind of reputation helpful in claiming the Iron Throne and the implied human cost all on top of that? Whew. Okay, so sure, they're incredible killers who won't kill anyone they aren't ordered to, but the good masters are going to start training new Unsullied and quicker than they would have if their inventory was entirely depleted. She doesn't want to create new rush demand for this product. She doesn't want the next round of strangled dogs and murdered babies to be rushed to market. So no wonder she's so frustrated with Jorah. This is an incredibly difficult spot she's put in. She's damned if she does, damned if she doesn't. But she's also very clever. She resists the inevitable. She doesn't completely listen to Jorah. She doesn't, isn't, her opinion isn't fully suborned by other attitudes. She still finds her own road. It's a different high road. It was one not given to her, not suggested to her by anyone. It's her completely her own idea. It's less hellish, less bloody, although it's very bloody, but it's the, the right people being blooded, and it comes with much less moral baggage. And that's exactly what she does. It won't be said she did business with the slavers. She did not do a deal with the devil. She cheated the devil. It's, it's almost always true in life that keeping your word and conducting transactions in a forthright and honest manner is right and just. Most of us will never be in a situation in life where killing someone else is justified. But those situations do exist and have existed. This is the kind of situation that proves there are exceptions. This scenario proves that nothing is absolute. Even a king's guard can have reason to kill their king to save others. And it's better to cheat the devil to prevent the devil from cheating others than it is to do an honest deal with someone who is going to take the proceeds of that deal and cheat other people with it, or worse than cheat them. 
And Jorah argues that doing it the right way is what got Rhaegar killed. But it's not true that this is the only way anyone ever wins. Like I said, there's other ways. Danny is smart enough to take lessons from all of that without giving in, coming up with her own way to do it. I love that. Some thoughts from y'all. Violent Messiah 666, something I caught in this chapter when Danny's back on the boat. She thinks of dreaming about a comely lover with a shifting shadow face. Comely is how Euron is described. Hey, good catch. Yeah. And there is more evidence coming later that Euron and Danny are going to have interactions of some type of degree. We don't know exactly, but yeah. Newt Rock 44 says, does she gain a bell after this battle? I noticed they put one back in when they braided her hair. I don't know if she gets one specifically for this, but that would make a lot of sense. I, I can't recall, but they, they have given her bells for other things, and this would certainly seem to count. Um, it would be reason enough, but I didn't catch that. Good good one. Uh, good question. Well, maybe we look at look out for that. Rennie, Archmaster Rennie from Flick. The multi-ethnic nature of the Unsullied and the Slaves and Slavers Bay in general is emphasized here. It's hard to remember this because of the TV portrayal where they're pretty much all people of color. Here there's a wider variety, not to mention things like Book Masande, who, uh, you know, Book the, the Nathai look way different than... And she's a child. Yeah, she's 10 and has golden eyes. And yeah, it's very different. So Masande, TV Masande is awesome. No shade on her. But clearly Book Masande is just a different thing. She's, you know, unearthly almost. And frankly, as Stephanie the Peerless points out, so is Danny. Uh, she's kind of, or I actually think it was Tree Girl that pointed that out. She's kind of unearthly looking with the purple eyes and the the, the hair. You know, Amelia Clark is incredibly beautiful, but the book Targaryens are almost alien looking. They look fantastical, and yeah, they're white, but they're like, uh, they're not Caucasian white. You know, <laughs> there's something else. Stephanie, uh, the peerless, points out it's interesting that Danny is already worried about her baby dragons accidentally burning things they're not supposed to. This type of forward thinking that Danny shows here, some more of which we'll get into in Danny 3, but it all makes it really hard, really hard to see how Danny is going to want to intentionally blow up cities later uh full of innocence it's just this is the kind of forward thinking and the kind of what are the unsullied gonna do when i'm done using them as soldiers she just already she's asking these questions uh, stefan b says this is like hell astapor but perhaps it's also a bit like valyria as well because of all the 14 flames and cities built amongst oh, maybe even fantastical as Lava flow, just, you know, being right there. There's depictions of Valyria that go that far. They're not canon descriptions of it, but, yeah. Uh, Nina has already perhaps looked this detail up for us. Daenerys 4, A Storm of Swords, speaks of Danny wearing twin bells in her hair. So we've got the reference to the first bell. This could be that second one that she gets from beating the slavers. That seems to fit. We'll, uh, if, if anything contradicts that later, we'll point it out. And Nina also suggests this is probably the first chapter that hints at the Valyrians starting off as shepherds. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I didn't catch that. Um, little bits and pieces of Valyrian history are thrown, are peppered throughout all the books, of course. It's one of the great topics that if you pull it all together, it's a big topic all on its own. But I definitely wasn't aware of when that detail was first brought up. That's cool. All right. We spent a lot of time on that chapter as we knew we would. But let's move on. Brand two, story time, the tourney of Hall, a.k.a. the gang meets a friendly little. This is the start of Brand chapters entering the rare but highly focused phase, meaning there's not as nearly as many of them, but they're more about him and his companions and, and greater mysteries rather than, you know, being an observer, which he was for quite a lot of the last book and the first book. Uh, and it... Almost it didn't quite start with his first chapter in this book because he hadn't decided until the end of that chapter to head for the Three-Eyed Crow. And that's when it really begins in earnest. So let's get right to it. Here's the first line. No roads ran through the twisted mountain valleys where they walked now. And there you go. That really just emphasizes that he's no longer an observer because... There's no people to observe, literally, <laughs> other than themselves. And, well, this rare encounter with something like this friendly little, or later on they run into Sam and Gilly, and later, and they have a near brush with John and the Thens later. But 
Very few people. So the contrast between Danny 2 and Brand 2 is huge and immediate here. Danny 2 is this decaying hellscape where men exploit the suffering of other humans for their profit, even the slight, massive suffering for minor profit. Brand 2 is a cool, peaceful, beautiful, expansive land where there are people willing to risk their own lives and loss of personal profit to help Brand. It's a, yeah, it's very much the opposite in that sense. Here's where I remind you, my fellow Westorians, of a factoid, a piece of trivia that some of you are likely not aware of. Others are quite aware of it. The original plan title for A Dream of Spring was A Time for Wolves. It was changed, and you might guess why. Bit spoilery of a title, isn't it? <laughs> Especially with lines like this already out there, quote, It was different when there was a Stark in Winterfell. But the old wolf's dead and young ones gone south to play the Game of Thrones, and all that's left us is the ghosts. The wolves will come again, said Jojen solemnly. You know, it's funny. Bran is king. It really would have been a time for wolves. Yeah. In fact, that's one of our Flick commenters, or I think it was on Flick, made that exact point. It's like, ooh, the time for wolves really refers to Bran in a way that we hadn't thought about. It's like, oh, yeah. And it, it fits with the Dream of Spring, too, because he's... He's it's the person more dreaming subtle. of spring. Yeah, and he's the most powerful dreamer. I mean, Danny has plenty of powerful dreams, but they're not really... She's not in control of them. They're kind of like they enter her head, and she has them, and they're important, whereas Bran is actually learning to control all that. So it's a neat little... You can kind of see where why that change was made, but how it still suggests a lot of the same things, but less bluntly. Now, I suppose it's important for Bran to be reminded firsthand how his family is seen by others, meaning the little here, and to know that there are people who will remember him and fight for him. Simple kindness, 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 <laughs> simple kindness like this is very satisfying to the reader and prepares us for the rough road ahead as much as it does prepare these characters for their rough road ahead. Quote, when they woke the next morning, the fire had gone out and the little was gone. But he'd left a sausage for them and a dozen oat cakes folded up neatly in a green and white cloth. Some of the cakes had pine nuts baked in them and some had blackberries. Bran ate one of each and still did not know which sort he liked the best. One day there would be Starks in Winterfell again, he told himself, and then he'd send for the Littles and pay them back a hundredfold for every nut and berry. Ha ha ha, how cool is that? Like, that line sounded neat, like, yeah, good boy, Bran's a good kid, he's gonna pay that kid, uh, that little back, a hundredfold. But now that we have a, a strong sense that he's gonna be king, ooh, boy, can he do that, boy, a hundredfold, yeah, he, that's not gonna be an exaggeration, so, what is he, he's gonna summon this guy and give him a hundred, uh hundred blackberry tarts or something <laughs> <laughs> and that guy really does deserve a reward right i mean not only is his kindness and openness a, a thing of goodness it's 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 manna from heaven in a, in a time where there's so little of that but he takes this risk he's turning down a large reward i mean ramsey is is offering well i don't know exactly what ramsey's offering but silver it's good silver uh, and roost if he weren't in the south would also be offering a reward here's the line the bastard's boys, I. He was dead, but now he's not. And paying good silver for wolf skins, a man hears, and maybe gold for word of certain other walking dead. He looked at Bran when he said that, and it's summer stretched out beside him. That's kind of funny to think about. Again, we're trying to think about this outside perspective. What does it look like to everybody else? So if you're someone like this little, you heard that Ramsey Bolton or Ramsey Snow was dead. And then you heard that Bran and Rickon were dead. And now none of them are dead. <laughs> it's like, wait a second. Who are spreading these stories? Because none of them are true. Uh, I wonder if they would probably be able to verify that Winterfell was torched. Because that would be, that's physically visible. And then word of that would spread. But a lot of these other rumors, uh, well, there's now reason to question them. Because some of these, so many of these other things have proven untrue. So you wonder what other rumors that we know are true, are people in the North questioning. Not only will Bran seek out this little to reward him if he survives, that would be a kick in the tooth, wouldn't it? If this little turns out to not survive, which unfortunately that has to be considered a, a strong reality given how rampage the war will probably be, or the North will probably be when the others get there. Can but I we point see out something yeah. that I just realized in the chat? Sure. We've got little right now with their nuts, and then we had Smallwood with their nuts. 
<laughs> and they're the best. They were so nice to both Arya and Bran. Whoa. And they both have nuts on their sigil. <laughs> Acorns. And... Little and small. Yeah. yeah, little and small. Anyways, I'm just I was just very tickled by it right now. I had to share it. That's good. Good catch. <laughs> So we're going to see these mountain clansmen in greater numbers in A Dance with Dragons. So we know they're going to be important and we know they're we've seen here in advance what they're at least a hint of what they're capable of. But I don't know that this even does justice of what they really do. Eventually, they're really quite ferocious and strong. In those chapters, we see a very similar sentiment to what's expressed by this kind stranger here, the type that makes it quite clear why he and others prefer Stark rule to Bolton rule. We also see that the temperament of this unnamed little is not necessarily representative of what he's capable of. He's this, he seems very relaxed. <laughs> but let's jump forward. Uh, maybe this guy's an exception, but again, look at some of these other ones. We have this famous quote from Hugo Wall, a.k.a. Big Buckets, to one of Stannis's knights, Sir Corliss Penny, well, we're, this is in A Dance with Dragons, and well, this quote is so good. Winter is almost upon us, boy, and winter is death. I would sooner my men die fighting for Ned's little girl than alone and hungry in the snow, weeping tears that freeze upon their cheeks. No one sings songs of men who die like that. As for me, I am old. This will be my last winter. Let me bathe in Bolton blood before I die. I want to feel it spatter across my face when my axe bites deep into a Bolton skull. I want to lick it off my lips and die with the taste of it on my tongue. Aye, shouted Morgan Little. Blood and battle. Then all the hillmen were shouting, banging their cups and drinking horns on the table, filling the king's tent with the clangor. Aha, see, who was that? The voice I threw in there amongst the Shea's quote. A little, Morgan Little, whose nickname, Middle Little. Hey, I didn't come up with that one. George did. <laughs> Since we don't know which Little is in this scene, we don't know his relation to Morgan. But Morgan's older brother is a ranger with the Night's Watch, so it's not him. <clears throat> but he does happen to still be alive somehow. After all the, the awful things happening to the Night's Watch, that guy's alive. Another take here, too. <laughs> Stan is having these guys on his side? Let's not uh, let's not underestimate that, huh? And another another take here. It's too bad Rob didn't have these guys with him because that certainly would have helped. Although it wasn't the battles Rob really needed help with. In this chapter, they refer to Hugo Wall's kin, Theo Wall, and by they I mean the Reeds, and they point out that he rode with Howland during the war, but they do not mention perhaps because their father maybe didn't tell them that Theo Wall was one of the seven men who was at Lord, with Lord Eddard at the Tower of Joy, along with Howland Reed and the rest. Hmm, interesting. So these mountain clans are notably different from the ones in the Vale, but they are m both mostly blood of the first men. However, in the Vale, the Andals invaded and pushed the older culture aside, and they've been marginalized, whereas in the North, they're mostly all first men, and they seem to coexist in peace. In fact, that's exactly what we hear from Brandy. He says, well, they'll leave us alone if we leave them alone. It's very much coexisting in peace. They are perhaps the closest thing to the free folk on this side of the wall, though. And it's really interesting when we look for these cultural parallels. We look for similarities between the free folk and the North. Well, it's not just their toughness, but in the way they lean towards merit rather than birth. These heads of these clans are called Lord by the Starks and Mandalays and Umbers and the rest. But as is said in this chapter, they don't call each other by those titles. Another thing they have in common is how the rest of the world misperceives them. Both the free folk and the mountain clans are actually a lot more numerous than outsiders are led to believe. We've discussed how even the Citadel doesn't properly account for how large the land beyond the wall is. And this error is compounded by the per pervasive but persistent underestimation of how hardy human beings can be, especially when they have to be. <laughs> In other words, like the Unsullied. I mean, for God's sake. In other words, there are a lot of people in Westeros who think Beyond the Wall simply cannot support a large population. And they're not entirely wrong, but they've definitely guessed way too low. Similarly, the reason knowledge about these clans is lacking is they don't have maesters. And so the, the most learned men are, are, have a lot of misperceptions and misconceptions about what really goes on there. 
and it's the people who live there, the people who have lived there for a long time, they're the ones who really know the truth. So moving on to the story portion of this chapter, I don't know what's bigger. The revelations regarding the turning of Harren Hall or the mysteries leading up to it. I think over time, initially the tournament of Harren Hall is the eye-grabbing thing. And there's still mysteries around it. But to me, it's this green men stuff and this stuff with Hal and Reed trying to learn magic. That's the one that really has me going, what is all that about? That's a deeper mystery. And I don't mean like more important mystery. I just mean harder to figure out with more possibilities. You can't narrow it down as easily. So Bran seriously needs to remember this chapter himself <laughs> and ask for a follow-up on this exchange at some point in the future. It, it begins like this. Did he meet the green men? <clears throat> yes, said Mira, but that's another story and not for me to tell. My prince asked for knights. Also, Mira really wanted to, to keep him waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> green men are good, too. They are, she agreed, but said no more about them. Yeah, well, I, I wish he would, though. I mean, <laughs> and related, what is up with this quote? The lad knew the magics of the Cranachs, she continued, but he wanted more. Our people seldom travel far from home, you know. We are a small folk, and our ways seem queer to some, so the big people do not always treat us kindly. But this lad was bolder than most, and one day, when he had grown to manhood, he decided he would leave the Cranachs and visit the Isle of Faces. No one visits the Isle of Faces, objected Bran. No one? Hmm, I don't I don't mean Arya, but <laughs> but interesting, because this lad, of course, is their father, Howland Reed, and as we know already, and we've brought up a few times that Howland is knowledgeable about green dreams and green seers and such. So this trip to the Isle of Faces might bear we might be where he got that knowledge. The same in, the same knowledge that led him to send his son to Bran when he heard about all these dreams. This is might might be how he got on that track. But even before he learned these new things, he already had some magic, which Mira describes like this. He could breathe mud and run on leaves and change earth to water and water to earth with no more than a whispered word. Now, some of that I don't think is actually magic, or at least there's room to think it's not. Like breathing mud, that I figure is literally using reeds, like their house name, like as a snorkel, because those are those are like hollowed out, like tuby things. So you can do that. Uh, well, I think you can anyway. <laughs> Running on leaves. I'm less sure about that, but it could be hyperbably, hyperbably, hyperbole about being very aware of telltale signs on objects below the water, like just knowing the, the landscape of a swamp really well. And it looks like magic, but it's really not. It's just being hyper aware and used to what a swamp is like, kind of like how Euron is described as using magic when he's really just an expert sail sailor. Now, he also uses magic, though. But some of the things he does are not magic, but called magic. And Melisandre is someone who loves to lean into that because she realizes it makes her seem more powerful. There's a recurring theme, basically, of magic and spells, meaning trade secret or obscure technology. For example, Tabho Mott, the smith, refers to using spells in trying to color the Valyrian steel blades he presents to Tywin in Tyrion's next chapter. Or when Shay thinks Varys is using spells to open secret doors and Tyrion says, yeah, counterweight spells. But that last one, earth to water and water to earth with no more than a whispered word. That might be magic. I don't know. That, that sounds, of all the things she says, that's the one that most sounds like real magic to me. Nina suggests, uh, you know, the whispered word maybe by like, a metaphor for how quickly something happens. Like in the time it says to say something, a word or two, you can move on uh, quickly, something like that. But it's, this is, this one's tough to explain without magic. So I'm very curious about that. Just as the Hal and Reed magical stuff remains, perhaps the biggest mystery here. We're all wondering about brands end game as well. And how all that magic ties to him. And he's not thinking about the tournament that much after the story. Like, like I was just saying, it's, it's the magic that draws his attention. He's thinking about what, about doing what Howland did specifically. Quote. If the, yeah, that is where I am. 
Yeah. If the little Krannic men could visit the Isle of Faces, maybe I could too. All the tales agreed that the green men had strange powers. Maybe they could help him walk again, even turn him into a knight. They turned the little Krannic men into a knight, even if it was only for a day, he thought. A day would be enough. Well, okay, so Bran going to the Isle of Faces, that makes sense. Uh, my favorite new tinfoil theory since the end of the TV show is that Bran will be the green king of the Isle of Faces. And, you know, his 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 own coloring matches the colors of the trident. He's a green seer, so you get the green, uh, the green fork, and then he's a blue-eyed red-headed kid so you got the red and blue there it's a maybe a little stretch but i think it's cool it certainly fits well but it's interesting here that bran has misinterpreted uh perhaps to mislead the readers who the knight of the laughing tree is he thinks that howland reed was turned into a knight for a day but mm, i don't think so the fandom thinks it's liana i agree king Ares sends rhaegar to find out who the king of the laughing the king the knight of the laughing tree is and Rhaegar says, I couldn't find them, but ends up naming Lyanna Queen of Love and Beauty? Hmm. And Mira calls that the sadder story here in this chapter. And this book is full of examples of Lyanna being great at horsemanship, which is crucial to good jousting. Jamie flat out says jousting is three quarters horsemanship. Uh huh. Hmm. A possible conundrum is that the story mentions that the Knight of the Laughing Tree had a, quote, booming voice. And some claim this is an argument against Lyanna, but it doesn't exactly support Howland Reed either because he's a tiny guy. So a booming voice wouldn't really work for either of them. But it could be mummery or magic or, well, we've got a reference here that Nina found. When Catelyn first sees Brienne at Bitterbridge, she also thought Brienne's voice sounded muffled and distorted through her dented helm. So the acoustics of a, especially if the helmet's larger than your head, it would create a weird echo maybe i don't know if that's really the case point being you can't say the booming voice is some sort of a gotcha it's a it's just a quirk but there might be a completely rational expl explanation that doesn't change the outlook much the three knights the night uh, of the laughing tree challenges is are from house frey house high hey i don't know how to say it h-a-i-g-h and house blunt House Blunt, of course, is the house from Boris Blunt, the crappy Kingsguard is part of. House Hay is barely mentioned. So I don't have anything to say about them. That's the that's the uh, the pitchfork or the yeah, that's the pitchfork and the blunt or the porcupines. I might have gotten that backwards. It doesn't matter. And of course, the fray is the Twin Towers. And Liana, so Liana learning to joust via her brother, because Brandon would take her riding. They would go riding off, you know, by themselves and hang out and where their father wasn't around. I mean, Howland Reed doesn't ride at all. He's he lives in the neck. They don't have horses there. He walked from the neck to the tournament and to the to the Isle of Faces. He didn't ride a horse, even even when traveling. So, really, so many things line up to point to Liana, not Howland. But the the most important thing to me, it says so much about why Howland would be among those at the Tower of Joy with Ned trying to save Liana. For him, it's not just about supporting his friend Ned. It's repaying Lyanna for what she did for him here. It's returning the favor. In other words, for literary purposes, the other choices are just so much less interesting. Literary evidence is funny that way. Sometimes it can be too flimsy to rely on, but other times it's as, as overwhelming as any piece of evidence can ever be. So if you spell out the possibilities, Lyanna is just, as the Knight of the Laughing Tree is, so very satisfying and poignant. And Howland is just like, Oh, that's a trick. That's a tricky authorial thing there. Not that it would be bad, but it just it just ties so much together. It just seems to... Yeah, I, I really am convinced it's Liana. <laughs> In relation to all this, though, there's more going on at the tournament just the, than Liana and the Knight of the Laughing Tree and Rhaegar. There's, there's a lot of other things happening, so here's an important quote. Under Heron's roof, he ate and drank with the wolves and many of their sworn swords besides... Barrow down, hold on. <coughs> Under Heron's roof, he ate and drank with the wolves and many of their sworn swords besides. Barrow down men and moose and bears and mermen. The dragon prince sang a song so sad it made the wolf maid sniffle. But when her pup brother teased her for crying, she poured wine over his head. A black brother spoke 
asking the knights to join the night's watch. The Storm Lord drank down the night of skulls and kisses in a wine cup war. The Cranigmen saw a maid with laughing purple eyes dance with a white sword, a red snake, and the Lord of Griffins, and lastly with the quiet wolf. But only after the wild wolf spoke to her on behalf of a brother too shy to leave his bench. Okay, so real quickly, let me name all those characters. We've got the Black Brother speaking, asking the Knights to join the Knights' Watch. is probably Yorin. We know he's been going back and forth as a recruiter for 30 years. And it might be part of what brings Benjen in line here, because Benjen was there. The Storm Lord drank down the Knight of Skulls and Kisses in a wine cup war. That's Robert Baratheon drinking down Richard Lonmuth, who is... Some people, especially Lady Gwyn, she is the proponent of the originator of this theory, as far as I know, of of Richard Lonmouth being the knight of uh, being Lem Lemon Cloak. And one clue for this, I'll give you a teaser. The rest of the theory you should go find on your own and read about it. But one clue is is something we just went past last week, which was when Lem asks what happened to that wench she used to he liked to kiss, and the Ghost of Highheart says she's dead. <laughs> so. Skulls and kisses. Yeah, anyway. The Cranigman saw a maid with laughing purple eyes. That's Ashara Dane. Dance with the White Sword, a Red Snake, and the Lord of Griffins. And lastly, with the Quiet Wolf, but only after the Wild Wolf spoke to her. The Wild Wolf is Brandon. The Quiet Wolf is Ned. The Lord of Griffins is John Connington. The Red Snake is Oberyn Martell. The White Sword who dances with Ashara Dane is unclear. Uh, it's not Jamie, because Jamie left early. He was sent home as soon as he got his white cloak. And it's probably not Barristan, because Barristan thinks about Ashara, thinks about how he's in, he's in love with her. And you would think he would remember dancing with her. So, mm, it's hard to say. It could be Lewin Martell. It could be her own brother. Certainly can dance in these sort of situations. So, Arthur is a reasonable guess. But we probably can't get any closer than that on the guessing. Uh... Other characters mentioned elsewhere, you know, we got Barrow Down Men, Moose, Bears, Mermen. The Barrow Down Men is House Dustin and the Men of Barrowton. Probably Lord Willem, the same one that goes to the, uh, dies at the Tower of Joy with, with, uh, alongside, uh, Ned's other companions. And the Moose, of course, is House Hornwood. Maybe Lady Danella, the one who eats her, who has her fingers flayed by Ramsay. Probably Lord Halas, who, the one who dies on the Green Fork. Bears, of course, Mormont, that's probably Jora. Uh, maybe Mage Mormont. Gior was probably already in the Night's Watch by then. Of course, the Mermen of the Manderleys, Willis and Wendell, were both old enough to have competed. Wyman maybe would have competed, but he uh, pro- maybe had been too old by then, but almost certainly would have been there. Knight of Skulls of Kisses, I mentioned, he was also Squire to Rhaegar, which is uh, re- interesting that he was drinking against Robert and Robert and Rhaegar had their issues. Of course, Robert and Rhaegar's issues didn't start till this event. (laughs) Uh, And that seems to be it. Now, why is Ashara at all catching the Kranigman's eye? Why do, why is she so important? There's all these different people he could be watching, but she's the one that he particularly notices and mentions to his kids later. Certainly there's lots of theories about Ashara. We're not going to go super deep in all the various Ashara theories. But it's interesting to note that if she's not John's mother, what else is there to do with her? Well, there's a lot to do with her. Why Why did she jump? What, what happened to her kid? Who was the father of her kid, If especially if not Eddard, which probably isn't Eddard, but it could be. But Eddard never once thinks of her. And if he had had a kid with her... Uh, even if it was still more, and that's it's just a rough thing to just never pop into his head when there's so many related things coming into his mind. Fever dreams and Arthur Dane and the tower. Yeah, just as something I feel like that would be a little cheaty by George to just not have Ned think of Ashara if she was really that important to him. And we know the Danes must think well enough of Ned, given Edric Dane's nickname is Ned. So all of this is TOJ mystery related. Ashara, Liana, Rhaegar, Arthur Dane, Ned, Howland, all the rest. They're all linked by the same central mystery. So the Tower of jo- the, the Tournament of Harrenhal contains a lot of other stuff, but the Tower of Joy is still the overwhelming factor here. But it's not but some of it is just Tower of Joy related. Ashara's stillborn child is represented here or mentioned here 
But that does that directly relate to the Tower of Joy, or is it just directly relate to a lot of the same characters that were involved in the Tower of Joy? I think the former. I don't think her child has anything to do with the Tower of Joy directly. It just has to do with some of this other stuff that's tangentially related. So, once again, we can look ahead to Barristan's point of view. This time for something a little peculiar, and but related to all this, this chapter is the Kingbreaker. Quote, but Ashara's daughter had been stillborn, and his fair lady had thrown herself from a tower soon after, mad with grief for the child she had lost, and perhaps for the man who had dishonored her at Harrenhal as well. She died never knowing that Ser Barristan had loved her. How could she? He was a knight of the King's Guard, sworn to celibacy. No good could have come from telling her his feelings. No good came from silence either. If I had unhorsed Rhaegar and crowned Ashara queen of love and beauty, might she have looked to me instead of Stark? And of course, George gets clever there and puts Stark, and so we're like, well, wait, which Stark? There's theories that it could even be Benjen or Rickard, but it seems more likely Ned or Brandon. Ned, w- Ned was the, supposedly the one who had an affair with her, but he was also supposedly too shy, so which is the case? On the other hand, Brandon was a womanizer, and Ned never once thinks of Ashara. I keep bringing that up. But Brandon clearly knew his brother had a crush. Would Brandon have hooked up with a girl that his brother had a crush on? Well, honestly, we don't know. Brandon is an enigma. We don't know that. All we know is he had a fiery temperament. He was loyal to his sister in terms of, you know, going after someone he thought had dishonored her. But that doesn't mean, you know, he could. He's an 18 ish year old or 21 year old. I forget how old he was here. Drinking, dancing. I don't know. He. He's got a wild temperament. Maybe he just did something he regretted later. It's it's entirely possible. We just don't know. Uh, there's problems with both theories. There's problems with the idea Ned slept with her. There's problems with the idea that Brandon did. So, frankly, though, I think the Brandon ideas are smaller. Or Brandon, the flaws with Brandon doing it are smaller. The, uh, uh, the, the counter-arguments, I mean. So here's an interesting quote as well. From Joe Buckley pulled this one because they're different, he insisted, like night and day or ice and fire. If ice can burn, said Jojen in his solemn voice, then love and hate can mate, mountain or marsh. It makes no matter. The land is one. He says it's probably a throwaway line, but considering it's Bran, the one who will likely find out about John or may even push John and Daenerys together, it's interesting nonetheless to, to mash these concepts together, combining ice and fire. Uh, so the John is a Targ stuff hasn't really surfaced that far in this book, although it's there for an attentive reader could have found it. Of course, as rereaders were, were hyper aware of it, looking for more clues. But yeah, it really fits in with the central theme in ways that first time readers may not have caught. Heck, you might have not, not have caught it this time. And interesting, too, the what we're seeing with with this man in the cave, the little he's kind of this is basic guest right here. This is very straightforward. I mean, it's not his hearth. It's not his home. It was a cave. But it's conceptually, it's guest right. It's like you see some travelers on the road. You've got a fire. You've got a little food. The North is a difficult, harsh place. So if you can lend a hand, you should. Because someone, you may be in need of a hand yourself later. It's sort of a uh, cultural karma that's reinforced there. I, I, I like it. Before we get into the main uh, bit of the chapter, there's this little small tidbit about Bran seeing an eagle and once wanting to try and get inside it, like to slip in its skin. That's interesting because it's you don't know, like we don't know the rules of skin changing, but it makes us think ahead to maybe Bran's going to try to grab the dragon. That's something that we've all been wondering about ever back since book one, probably, if he's ever going to warg into a dragon. Or something like that. I mean, it also makes you think of, obviously, Aurel, yeah. the eagle, and then the whole connection there with them thinking about, with Varamir thinking about taking, you know, Ghost and how a dire wolf would have been fitting for him, which is multiple mentions of someone taking something over that already belonged to someone, I guess. Yeah, very true. That's that's a good that's a good point. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's hard not to think of skin changing in eagles and be like, uh, at least consider Aurel. And yeah, and that leads you to like what you said, Orel being shoved aside, his consciousness being pushed aside and gets us very deep into the old uh, how does skin changing work <laughs> <laughs> rabbit hole or eagle hole. <laughs> uh, so 
Joe agrees with the idea that Benjen chose the Night's Watch in part because of the the rebellion, uh, what happened during it, and maybe because of secrets that were spilled. But he points out something I'd never thought about. Maybe it's a little little symmetry is if if Benjen chose to join the Night's Watch during this moment, during this kind of party, this tournament, it might be a lot. Uh, have a lot in common with John. John won. He chooses to join the Night's Watch when drunk and at a party. <laughs> so Benjamin may have done the same thing, which would make Benjamin's comments to John a lot more point. He's like, are you sure you want to join the Night's Watch right now? <laughs> Maybe he's like, he doesn't say, I did the same thing. I joined when I was drunk too. But it, it, you can see how that would really, really fit. Good catch, Joe couple of random thoughts from Nina. She says, let the record show that I thought this section should be called The Gang Gets a Little Help. I must hang my head in shame because she's absolutely right. That would have been a better name based on my sense of humor anyway. (laughs) Uh, In reference to the line, no one visits the Isle of Faces. Well, not only do we have an example of Hal and Reed doing it here, but Nina reminds us that Adam Valerian did it in the Dance of the Dragons. Hmm, yes, very good point. And we don't know what happened to him there either. Uh, but it's it's one of these things that's kind of, well, he went there. <laughs> and then he came back, and soon after, he fought bravely and died. So no one ever got to, you know, interview him about his time there, if he ever if he ever even made it. So, something to file away for later to consider that a few other people have been to the Isle of Faces, and it's interesting that it was a, a member of House Valarian of all of all people, a bastard of House Valarian, in fact. Hmm, Targaryen blood in there, yeah. Hmm, yeah. All right, some thoughts from you all from Richard Tabor, super chat. Hope that voice is doing okay tomorrow. Here's for some lozenges, <laughs> however that is spelled for those dulcet tones. Yeah. I have streamed four days in a row, so my voice is maybe a little mm, occasionally getting a little scratchy here, but we, we, we soldier on and thank you for noticing that Richard and for, uh, sending me some, uh, voice love. Appreciate that. A big question we all have, do Mira and Jojen know about the Tower of Joy? I mean, they know parts of it, but do they know the ultimate secret? Do they know about John? It's interesting because they clearly know this story very well, and they are aware that it's unusual that Bran hasn't been told. That, well, at least they have just become aware of that <laughs> during this chapter. So they're like, they definitely have enough information to figure it out. Whether Howland explicitly told them, yeah, by the way, John, that kid isn't how isn't Ned's. Uh, I know that, but. I kind of think he didn't tell them because Ned wouldn't even tell his wife. So I kind of feel like they had an agreement or an understanding that no one would be told. However, clearly they've heard this story, so they've learned something. They maybe, maybe have been explicitly told, but figuring it out, it'll be interesting, especially if Bran goes in the tree and sees these visions and then tells them and they'd be like, yeah, well, that backs up what we were thinking, too. We were kind of already uh, on that line. You just confirmed it for us. Bren thinks of how Osha and Rickon are at White Harbor. <laughs> and, like, maybe safe and maybe happy there. But, in fact, they're probably having a hard time of it sailing to Skagos or have already gotten to Skagos. Or, yeah, they're, they're, they're maybe eventually going to be at White Harbor. It kind of is a, is a sort of foreshadowing for Davos being sent there by Wyman Manderly to get them. But uh, it hasn't happened yet. Again, again, Aemon the Dragon Knight is mentioned in this chapter. That dude pops up so often. I've been meaning to do an episode on this guy forever, but we do talk about him a lot in our Aegon the Unworthy episode, which is part one of our Blackfire series. So if you can't wait for more on Aegon the Aemon the Dragon Knight, that's uh, that's our our best source for it so far. <clears throat> uh. In keeping with George's usual and brilliant cross chapter back storytelling, Jamie will be brought here in his next chapter, not to, you know, the north in the cave with the little, but the, but Heron Hall, I mean. And think about the tournament from his perspective, which is to say there's not much to think about. <laughs> he was given his white cloak and sent home. So unfortunately, he doesn't have a lot of additional perspective to give because he wasn't actually a witness to very much of it. 
Stefan B from Flick points out that how Bran is speaking kind of cutely about how he doesn't like love stories. He says Hodor doesn't like that so much, and it's you know it's like it's cute. Like I said, like something a young boy would say to deflect that it's his opinion, but it is a dark undertone to it because, well, frankly, uh, if if he's going to be taking over Hodor's body and mind later, then declaring what Hodor does and doesn't like is. Well, it's 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 got a different sense to it. It's it's like he's making those choices for Hodor rather than just being this cute kid that's deflecting his own. You know, he doesn't want to admit that he <laughs> what he thinks about love stories. Paul, uh, oops, I have two notes here in this chapter that do not belong here. <laughs> that belong in a different chapter. So we're going to move on to Davos. Davos two here. Uh, Put that quote and this one in Danny 3, please. Those two bottom ones. All right. Davos 3. The once and future hands share a cell, a.k.a. the one with Mel's lecture on duality. The chapter itself is also split in two. It's kind of got its duality, like I brought up at the beginning of this episode. The two central features are Davos speaking with Melisandre and Davos speaking with Lord Alistair. And the first line of the chapter is... The cell was warmer than any cell had a right to be. Let us recall that Davos will be in a cell during a dance with dragons. And in that one, he will also fear death and will also be given excellent care and excellent food. And we love that because we love Davos. (laughs) It's lines like this that remind us why we love Davos. Quote... Perhaps he should have lied and told her what she wanted to hear, but Davos was too accustomed to speaking truth. There it is. And this is interesting because the structure of these books, the POV style in particular, gives us perfect insight. The kind we don't get on TV or even in real life. Simply put, we don't see inside people's heads on TV or in real life. POV chapters are highly unique in that way. Characters like Jamie and Theon are great examples because seeing inside their heads gives you clarity on their change in character that you can't quite be as certain of on TV. You cannot see the scope of their resolve or be certain that they're not lying or maybe it's false bravado. Uh, And when you see inside someone's head, you get a better, purer sense of how accurate that is. Melisandre herself is a great example of a character who got a POV chapter. And when when she did, it really changed what we all thought of her quite dramatically because of that same certainty we gained by getting a peek at those inner thoughts of hers. And she tells Davos here that her powers enable her to judge if he's lying. And of course, he doesn't lie. And that's a big part of why she trusts him despite his intent to kill her. And that's something very interesting about zealots is that they they don't take things personally as often because to them, the only thing that matters is people's attitude towards their God. It's like your attitude towards me doesn't matter. Your attitude towards my God. That's what matters. You want to kill me? Eh, that's a that's a moral flaw on your part, not a, a reason for me to be mad at you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's one of the few things I find very enlightened about zealots. Uh, Melisandre, I, I wonder if the the High Sparrow, the book version, who we've seen very little of to this point, is going to be kind of like this too, where he won't take things personally and he's just all about, it's all about the beliefs, it's all about the faith and, you know, his, his personal attitude, his personal... Any sort of uh, insults to him or his pride doesn't mean a thing. Melisandre is very much like that. She doesn't. I mean, if you cannot take it personally that someone wants to kill you, you've really got that part of your life handled well. (laughs) You really have. That's a that's a type of bravery and and forward thinking and taking the high road that is just beyond most of us. So that's why she immediately broaches the subject of him wanting to kill her as soon as he answers truthfully and she's like i would have known if you lied she immediately brings up the murder of of, of her because she wants to convince him that it's she's not the enemy that look i'm i'm a devoted follower of stannis so are you let's work together on him she's trying to win him over his word also the fact that he says i will not kill you means a lot because he's proven himself a teller of truth. She can take that to heart. And of course, she's also a person of extreme confidence. 
and knows that Davos is valuable to Stannis. And so she wants that all to work out. She wants that ideally Davos and Stannis are allies. Davos is continuing, uh, is, 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 continues as part of his side, as part of, uh, you know, on his team. She wants all that to continue. So she's trying to con- recruit him here. And, and a lot of it comes off as pretty dark, though. Uh, even though <laughs> it's, it's, there's a lot of good to it, but she just brings up things like sleep with me and I'll give you pleasure you've never known. And also we'll make a shadow baby. And he call he finishes the sentence for her and says a horror will be created. But on reread, I mean, again, because we know that Melisandre is from her chapter, we know she's earnest. Yeah. She's mistaken on, several key details for example in this chapter alone she points about do you think i crossed the narrow sea or crossed half a world to seat you know some another empty vain king on the throne and he's like well well, that's i guess that's a pretty good point and this makes her just real quick in terms of us seeing she's earnest i mean shall we see that even more so and we, we as readers can't ignore that, I don't think. Yeah, right, yeah. I mean, she, she does give her committed. life. Yes, exactly. She is as committed as you can be, basically. Yeah, that's true. She gives her life and she gives her morals, potentially. So so that's a big change for Davos uh, over time. How he views her is if he start he because he didn't, just doesn't trust her. And so that's or should kinda, he? Why, yeah. why would you trust this woman at this point? Exactly. Yeah. No like, one, why? no one saying would trust her. Honestly, like if you've seen the the uh, things she's threatened. <laughs> yeah, she's burning people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, why? Of course, I don't trust you. But but that's that's George for you. He, you know, just as much as someone, she's not at all like Jamie or Theon or whatever. But very much, he's someone that looks bad and comes around looking, well, not so bad. I mean, there's still bad around her. There's still things she does that, like, that was awful. But she's not pure awful. She's not evil. She's misguided, not dark. Well, she's dark but and misguided. But you get what I mean. She's not a manipulator in that sense. She's not certainly not after her, out for herself. In that, she has things in common with, like, people like Varus. A true believer, whereas Varus is a true believer in... His philosophy for the perfect king, Melisandre is a true believer in her philosophy for the the one true God. And as much as Melisandre is, but as much as he's on the right track with the threat of the others, it's easy to find other flaws in her philosophy. She tries to make everything black and white because it's the basis of her faith is duality. And everything flows from that. Everything, that's the anchor. That's the, the base to her belief system that everything is light and dark, good and evil that's too simple, though. That The world is not that simple. But that's also part of what makes her great and interesting and fun. She's just, she contradicts herself. I mean, fiction in general may be overwhelmingly focused on the good-evil dichotomy. And George loves to blow that trope well out of the water by creating all these great characters. And Melisandre is somewhat unique because she's one of the few characters in the series that believes in pure black and white, but she's quite gray herself. (laughs) She just doesn't realize it. She just doesn't, it just doesn't come off that way. But when you really get down to it, yeah, she's quite gray. And it's not just people that are gray in a song of ice and fire all the time. It's situations like this one, like Danny at slavers Bay. What's the right move? What do you do? How do you know exactly how far to go? What, how do you know, how many innocents is it okay to kill to save the world? Is it zero? Is it not zero? I I don't know. So here's what Melisandre says. The, tr- <clears throat> the truth is all around you, plain to behold. The night is dark and full of terrors. The day bright and beautiful and full of hope. One is black, the other white. There is ice and there is fire. Hate and love, bitter and sweet, male and female, pain and pleasure, winter and summer, evil and good. So basically what she's saying is man evil, women good. <laughs> man bitter, woman sweet. Man fire pain, good. woman pleasure. <laughs> fire good, ice bad. <laughs> man death, female life. <laughs> also she's racist apparently. <laughs> 
It's another effect of George writing the world the way he has in a world of morally ambiguous characters. The ones who are very, very evil or very, very good actually stand out even more because they're rarer as types. And so, too, are people who believe in those extremes because most people in this story are not zealots and they're not just completely full of faith to the extent that almost everything else is pushed away. Most other people have doubts and uncertainties and gosh, why do the gods never answer prayers? Why do the gods allow evil things to happen? Things like that. In both this chapter and in his cell in the wolf's den, he, and by extension, we are presented with lore. Lore like the stuff about R'hllor. R'hllor, haha, I didn't even do that on purpose. And But in the north, he fittingly learns about human sacrifice, things like entrails hung on heart trees and winters so cold that the white knife itself froze. Here, in a cell on Dragonstone, he gets an education on the god of fire, including hearing about certain men burned as human sacrifices. So it's he's really getting the ice education and the fire education. And to get that, he had to spend time in two different jail cells. Hmm, that's peculiar, isn't it? Before that, there's also some of him getting used to being jailed and learning the details related to his captivity. It's a nice contrast to the other prison stay. Melisandre may have been waiting for Davos to make a full recovery before coming to him. When he, when he first starts, when he's first in jail, he's still got that cough. And uh, clearly her offer, if he'd come to him when he was sick and coughing and saying, hey, want to make a shadow baby? Are those blood blisters on your lips? Let's make a shadow baby. <laughs> so... You know, maybe she was just waiting for him to be healthy <laughs> for more pragmatic reasons. But still, the timing is interesting. And But he does. It's notable. He recovers even while in jail. Uh, he thinks, I'm as strong as I've been since the Blackwater. And then there's this line, which is a little curious. Uh, check it out. The poppy made him sleep. And while he slept, they leached him to drain off the bad blood. Or so he surmised by the leech marks on his arms when he woke. Leeches on him while he was asleep and Melisandre's involved in the conversation. Ah, maybe I'm reading too much into that because if she wanted to leech him, she could just do it. I don't know if they needed to be sneaky about it. But given we're right around the time when Melisandre is leeching people and throwing, their le throwing those leeches in the flames and getting results, it's kind of hard to not at least consider that here. Uh, so, but I don't, I don't know exactly what would come of it and what, you know if this connects to anything else, but something to think about. So when she comes to speak to him, it's curious right away because there's this line, he felt a queer flush come over him and then he looks up and sees her. So it's like he sensed her presence. Hmm. She addresses her own power, which might have been on display right with that moment. And she also addresses the lack of power shown by the seven, something the fandom seems very well aware of, but most were not aware of on their first read. Because for all you know, the seven are going to do something just in the next chapter. It's not till the end you go back and maybe think, huh, the seven never did anything overtly uh, magical or supernatural that anyone can directly point to and be sure about. Now, Sandra, however, is, is all over that line of thinking. Now, recall that Davos felt out of sorts amongst the great lords in their splendor, and of course with Melisandre as well. But he's not impressed by Lord Alistair Florent, his companion here for the second half of the chapter. Even Davos agrees that Lord Alistair's terms of surrender were, were mostly reasonable, but except for the huge part of it not being his right to make the offer in the first place. Only Stannis can surrender, and that's it. Fact. Alistair's like, do you want to die? And he's like, no, but it's not my call. And it's interesting, too, because he doesn't know that Lord Alistair has lost the position that Davos is about to gain. He doesn't has no idea he's about to be named to Lord Alistair's former office of Hand of the King. Lord Alistair's letter, uh, his offer, dooms him. He's burned by Melisandre when the fleet sail to Eastwatch and the Wall. His burning gives those ships favorable winds, apparently. This after Davos reads a certain letter out loud to Stannis, the one from the Night's Watch. From Aemon. <laughs> this immediately after he defies his king by sending off Edric Storm, so Edric is not burned. And hey, ironically enough, Lord Alistair would probably agree with the decision to sneak Edric off. I don't know that Alistair is a big fan of uh, the burnings, but... Edric is uh, his great nephew. So, you know, most most Westerosi 
are pretty protective of their family and are not okay with even their bastard nephews being burned by sorceresses. A detail that probably escaped 99% of the fandom, though, is looking else on Alistair Florence, a family tree, is that he is Sam Tarly's grandfather. Right? Whoa, hey, where'd that come from? So, yeah, his mother is Alistair's eldest child, meaning Sam's mother is Alistair's eldest child. His eldest son, Alicane Florent, is now Lord of Brightwater Keep, though, according to the Iron Throne, it belongs to Garland Tyrell. However, possession is nine-tenths of the law, and thanks to Euron attacking the Shield Islands, Garland's plans to take Brightwater Keep by force have been delayed. His youngest daughter, again, Alistair Florence, youngest daughter, his final and final child is, get this, this guy's just got all sorts of entanglements, doesn't he? The wife of Lord Hightower, but he's not grandfathered any of the Hightowers before you uh, get to, you know, get that impression. Because this daughter of his, Rhea Florent, hasn't had any children with Lord Leighton. She's his fourth wife. Well, we don't know if that's true. Nina says, Nina points out that maybe she's the mother of Humphrey because he's young, but we're not sure about that. So it's possible Rhea has, she is the mother of one, maybe two of the last children, but certainly not the, the elder ones. Anyway, the letter, Lord Alistair's letter, huge mistake, but he was right about one thing. He does, when he says talk of raising dragons from stone is madness, well, he's definitely right about that. Danny's already done it, for one. That prophecy's already been fulfilled. He mentions a litany of former hatching attempts. That's kind of fun to see, uh, get some backstory on, you know, the, he mentions the nine mages and the wildfire, all that. So, you know, that was Summer Hall, I suppose. And uh, this is interesting, too, because it's all happening on Dragonstone, the island best known for hatching and raising dragons, which is probably part of what really helped move Melisandre. Now, as far as Melisandre goes, the prophecy she seems to be believing in Stannis for, of course, it applies, seems to apply to Dannis, to Dannis, to Danny, And it fits so well that she is seeing Stannis as Daenerys because that's the, the being she probably saw uh dragonstone and saw this like shadowy figure and just thinks it's stannis but it's almost certainly daenerys she's really seeing uh and of course that's important too to note that makoro was sent by the red priests this was like an official decision but melisandre sailed to dragonstone on her own it was her call it wasn't from orders from above so Nina thinks that she saw in the flames that Melisandre is, saw in the flames Azor Ahai reborn connecting to Dragonstone and assumed that it meant the Lord of Dragonstone, Stannis, was the chosen of her lore. Of course, where she's wrong is that in the future, presuming it goes at all like the TV show or how some certain other foreshadowing in the books will go, that Danny will take Dragonstone. She'll be the Lord of Dragonstone, Lady of Dragonstone, whatever, Queen on Dragonstone. And that's who Melisandre was seeing. And, all, and that makes so much sense because all these things Danny, uh, Mel is attributing to Stannis are actually attributed to Danny. Fits quite well when you lay it out that way. All right, a few thoughts from Joe. It occurs to him this is now the fourth dungeon of a great castle we've seen. A uh, good time to shout out Joe's Great Castles book. He would be aware of things like this. Tyrion's been in the Sky Cells, Ned's been in the Black Cells, Catelyn has visited the dungeons of Riverrun, Arianne's later going to get locked up in Sunspear, maybe that's not quite the same thing as he points out, but it's it's a, a prison for, for the Highborn. <laughs> Gets me wondering if we'll ever see Casterly Rock's dungeons, certainly Jamie mentions them, other people have mentioned them, Highgarden maybe, uh, or... Winterfell's dungeons. It's kind of interesting. We've been to Winterfell several times, but the actual dungeons, I don't think we've actually ever witnessed that. We do see them on TV with uh, Ramsay being thrown in there, but that's, uh, you know, it's just some bars <laughs> on a set. It's There's no, no real interesting detail that I can think of that we can dig into there. Joe also points another castle function out here. Uh, quote, Davos could not complain of chill. The smooth stony passages beneath the great mass of Dragonstone were always warm, and Davos had often heard it said they grew warmer the farther down one went. A little bit of a connection to Winterfell there, and of course, you, it's, it's, hard, it's interesting to consider you know, Winterfell being the kind of epitome of, of ice in terms of castles, 
and Dragonstone being kind of the epitome of, of fire in terms of castles, but they both have this warmth beneath them, which is maybe uh, a clue to how people will deal with the Long Night if it comes again. Maybe uh, these these important uh, sources of heat below the earth will be very valuable. Um, what else do we have here? A couple more thoughts. Uh, Alistair worries about his rings when Davos doesn't even have fingers. That's a really kind of uh, important, poignant moment with regards to status. Alistair is lamenting lost clothes when Davos has lost sons. And even after Davos points this out, he <laughs> Alistair still kind of roughly compares the two. It's like, oh, geez, man, you're, you're, you're a little off on your comparison here. And it's it's amazing, too, how Alistair... This is what's driving him to give up. He's lost his clothes and some titles, maybe some land. Whereas Davos has lost sons and he's not given up. He hasn't even considered giving up or, or, or backing down from Stannis. So it's, it's a real talk about light and, and darkness or opposites. The kind of duality that Melisandre is bringing to the fore is very hugely apparent in this small human story. Uh, it's like subtopic within this chapter. Really cool. Some thoughts from Nina. It's a little ironic that Alistair Florian compa compa complains that some cook's boy or groom is prancing about King's Landing just now in my slashed velvet doublet. <laughs> uh, Davos's jailers is wearing the velvet doublet of Lord Sunglass, who was just burned. <laughs> now, of course... Uh, well, what that probably means is someone's going to be wearing Alistair Florence doublet that he's wearing in jail pretty soon because he's about to get burned as well. And it might be the other jailer. <laughs> so the jailers are all just going to be getting the benefit of all these guys getting burned at the stake. Wacky. Um, and Nina also points out a little parallel. Alistair's offer reminds her of the offer made from the greens to the blacks at the start of the dance of the dragons. Stannis agrees to give up his claim to the throne much as Rhaenyra would have been required to do the same. They both agree to drop accusations of bastardy like the strongs, right? The greens were, you know, accusing the, the Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra's kids of being, uh, strongs, not Targaryen slash Valerians. And, uh, so that's a parallel. And then, of course, both of them are given, uh, are allowed to keep Dragonstone as part of the deal. And there's the agreement to give up a daughter as hostage and uh, all that. So there's a lot of, a lot of very close similarities in the, in the scope of this uh, deal. Alistair Florence also overstating the case for Stannis's, um, how bad it is for him. Yeah, it's bad for Stannis. But he points out that the Valarians and Bar Emmons and a lot of these other lords of the Narrow Sea have bent the knee. But a lot of them are still there at the wall. They actually still follow Stannis to the wall. So they, you know, it's not quite as clear cut who's surrendered and who's given up. So it sounds, so it looks very clear that Alistair has exaggerated a bit. Would love to point out here that three of the four sons of King Makar are represented in this chapter. And we referred to the fourth, Aemon. Because Aemon is the one who uh, sends the letter to Stannis that Davos will read to him later with what's going on at the Night's Watch. The same letter that gets Stannis to change his mind and sail north. That isn't actually this chapter. I just mentioned it this chapter. Archmaester Rennie said... I have to said, say, did you say Aemon? For... Yeah. You know, it's interesting. That's one of those names that I feel like you really should say it one way because you have Maester Eamon. Yeah. And then you have like Eamon. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like, it's, they're like, yeah, Eamon Kai and Eamon Frey. Yeah, Eamon. Yeah, Maester Eamon. Yeah. And then Eamon Frey. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Eamon and Eamon. Yeah. <laughs> a little too close. Archmaester Rennie points out the quote, all your life, Davos Seaworth, as well say it was so yesterday. That's Melisandre speaking, of course. And it's a clue to how old she is. She's like, you know, your life, he's, she's saying, Davos, your life in the scheme of things isn't very long. And uh, yeah, it's to someone who's a lot older, that would be a perspective. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. That's a very good catch. I asked a lot of our uh, people following us on social media discussing these chapters what where the next Shadow Baby will come from. Because it's not going to be Davos, most likely. Stan she says it can't be Stannis. 
And Tree Girl uh, I, uh, has pointed out that Devin is perhaps the most likely. And I got to say, that rings true. That feels right to me. Devin has a crush on her. Uh, and he's young. Thus, perhaps full of this, this sort of life force that's necessary. We know that, Mel, you know, there can't, there's got to be another shadow baby. And Devin's as good a candidate as any, perhaps better. So, hmm. Poor Devin. Paul Berry, patron, uh, fellow Westorian, asks, has George left a big gap in Mel's plot armor by having her see threats to her person in the flames? So if someone snapped and became angry enough to kill her on a whim, i.e. not planned in advance, would she not see that coming? Maybe, he says, maybe Jojen's This Is Not The Day I Die is a sure advanced knowledge. Well, I think seeing... Uh, threats to her person maybe includes intent that comes on a whim in the future. I think it's more of just a specific type of flame reading, but you might be on to something there. You might have caught a a, uh, a loophole in how it works, but I'm not sure we can definitively take it that way because magic is magic and it reveals what it reveals. It doesn't have to be uh, that specific, but we're definitely working in unknown territory here. So it's a good thought because uh, it's something that we can't be sure of. And that does it for Davos 3. Let us move on to another Chapter 3. Uh, there'll be three in a row, in fact. <laughs> Actually, maybe even more, just not three today. I, I forget what the next one is next time. Let's look real quick. Uh, the first one next time will be Sansa 3. So yeah, we'll have four threes in a row. And this is the first one uh, after Davos 3 is the first one. Then we go to John 3 now. And that'll be followed by Daenerys 3. And next week, like I said, Sansa 3. This one we've called Naked and a Cave, a.k.a. the one where John knows something. Quote. The last night fell black and moonless, but for once the sky was clear. Hmm. It's almost time for John to go over the wall, and not only is he heading into danger and uncertainty and more moral conundrum, something that just seems to constantly dog him like a shadow, the danger is all the greater because he has to part from Ghost. And that also adds to the uncertainty, like he's now less protected, and he's wondering if he's going to see Ghost again. Luckily, being with Igrit helps balance things out as far as uh, his mood and his attitude and as temporary as their relationship is, it certainly is a boon in the short term. By having John speak directly to Ghost, by holding his head and speaking to him, saying, hey, direwolf, listen to me. We're getting an overt reminder that John's warg abilities are lagging behind in development, though powerful to be sure, because Veramir says so, and Veramir would know. But still, this makes his mega dream back in Clash of Kings John 7, the one we've just referred to so many times, it stands out even more, because... That still feels like kind of an awakening, but the powers are just still coming on slowly. He's not having wolf dreams. He's not doing anything, uh, certainly not doing anything consciously, but things subconsciously aren't really happening either. So it can be simultaneously true that he's very powerful, but still less powerful than Bran or even Arya. Uh, you know, being third place among three doesn't mean you're weak. So he tells Ghost to go back to Castle Black. And he does. It happens in John 12, nine chapters from now. John heads out for some alone time, and his powers immediately come on a little bit. It's like he crosses over to that side of the wall, and he, all of a sudden he feels this strange desire to eat and hunt elk. And then he looks up, and there's ghosts coming towards him. It's a happy reunion. And it's the same chapter he becomes Lord Commander. Uh. So while we have direct evidence of Bloodraven involving himself with Bran's life, we definitely have some of that with Jon too. The interference in the election, again, the mega dr awakening dream from A Clash of Kings, Jon 7. The, of course, the direwolves at the beginning of Bran 1. All that. These are all, this is all maybe even that raven that Jon passed by at the fist, like little things like that. You never know. Here's a little funny moment. I don't know if George was just having fun. <laughs> but what kind of blatant ice and fire combo name is arson ice axe <laughs> what <laughs> arson ice axe here we have a man named for unlawful fire starting whose actual crime was tunneling below an ice wall <laughs> if he had used like flamethrowers to burn through the wall that would be <laughs> that'd be more on point i love that name so much i don't know why this time spent with the fens that's 
this gives us a lot of opportunity to, to look at nuance and variety and diversity amongst the free folk cultures. George does not make them a monolith by any stretch of the imagination. Quote. The Thens were not like other free folk, though. The Magnar claimed to be the last of the first men and ruled with an iron hand. His little land of Then was a high mountain valley hidden amongst the northernmost peaks of the Frost Fangs, surrounded by cave dwellers, hornfoot men, giants, and the cannibal clans of the Ice Rivers. Ygritte said the Thens were savage fighters and that their Magnar was a god to them. John could believe that. Unlike Jarl and Harma and Rattleshirt, Steer commanded absolute obedience from his men. And that discipline was no doubt part of why Mance had chosen him to go over the wall. So George is flipping things on us yet again by presenting us with the mountain clans of the north, followed by the Thens here. Like, very close together. And also, again, he seems to have a lot of reasons for doing so. In Brand's chapter, we have Northmen who have a lot in common with the Free Folk. And here we have the Thens, whose system of authority and leadership is very southern in structure, at least, relative, at least by comparison. These cultural simil similarities are all of the, it's all in where you're standing, type variety the same sentiment expressed by men like Quarren that the free folk are just people when you get down to it the cultural differences are also all in where you're standing and when you're standing down an army of the dead those differences shrink to nothing well nothing important anyway so we're looking ahead to that we're, we're looking ahead to john trying to unite the wildlings with the rest of the cultures the free folk stannis doing all these things kind of related and in he has to grow close to them to understand them for that all to, to fit nicely. And, you know, in reverse, we have these examples of in brand two of, of Southerners, you know, Southerners in hand quotes there because they actually live in the Northern mountains, <laughs> but they're Southerners compared to the free folk who are more like free folk than the Thens in a lot of ways. So it's just really neat. And a grit, ah, very sad. Only a few chapters more, and they're separated for good, and then not long after that, she's killed. How long did you think they'd last when you read this series the first time? I mean, maybe a few of you thought they would last for good, but I bet most of us were like, yeah, this is, this is doomed love, isn't it? And how much of this will we be reminded of when a different kind of kissed-by-fire woman is in John's life? I've, I really wonder, like, it's... There's no overt foreshadowing in the cave scene that you can definitely 100% point to. You know what it is pointing to. I mean, I don't mean that there's no foreshadowing in that scene. I just don't see anything that you can be really certain of and be like, oh, the tale of Gendel and Gorn tells you, well, what? The tale of, you know, John and Igrit having this important moment of loving and everything and, and coming together and something that's new for both of them. What does this tell us about John's future? Something to do with Danny. Something to do with Danny and the relationship with Danny, but it's hard to be specific on it. We just kind of have a vague idea that these things are going to come back around again. So without knowing what it signifies, even without some sort of great theory, I, I, what does Gendel's children as a tale mean beyond the straightforward? Can we just... and Is it meant for us just to enjoy slash cry at the notion that they should have just stayed in the caves like Grit says? Is that really all there is to it? Well, maybe, maybe. And that's fine if that's all there is to it. That's a lot. That's a big, poignant, tragic moment, even if it doesn't have bearing on John's future. But I think it probably does. Also, this relates to me. One thing this relates to me with Danny, since we're talking about John and Danny's future relationship, potentially, that, that both of them are kind of struggling a bit with the idea that they deserve any of this not that they don't deserve to create justice in the world or to fulfill their destinies or what have you but both of them are a little wary about giving themselves pleasure john it's for his duty and and he's not supposed to be with a girl because of his oaths danny it's because of her oath to drogo and to you know him her being the only man he's ever really loved she's ever really loved etc now, so the, the reasons behind them, the, their oaths are very different, but they're still both kind of oaths when you get down to it. One is an oath to the realm. One is the oath to a person who's dead. Still, uh, there's definitely something to do there with similarities. So a few thoughts from uh, Joe. It's not just Egrit he's beginning to get used to. John admits he likes Longspear Rick and also states that he could easily betray all the free folk if they were like the Thens, which... If you take that in reverse, it means he cannot easily betray the others. 
no, with the other free folk. <laughs> And indeed, we do see that later. He is unable to abandon them at hard home. He's unable to leave them there. He's unable to push any sort of strategy that involves leaving them to die or not bringing them to his side. No matter the optics, no matter how bad it looks, again, like Danny working with Unsullied while using slave soldiers, John working with the free folk looks bad, but he knows it's the right thing to do, and he isn't going to bend on that one bit. The right thing is the right thing. No chance, no choice. Joe has a few other thoughts about Gorn's Way. He says, I'm truly obsessed with the idea of Gorn's Way, and specifically the idea that they might link up with the Winterfell crypts in some way. Will the dead travel through them, surprising everyone as they pop up in the middle of Winterfell? Will our last heroes use them as an escape from a Winterfell siege of the dead, cutting back behind enemy lines to deal with the problem at the heart of winter, or maybe connect back to Bran? Even if the tunnels don't connect to Winterfell, I love the idea of us seeing them used one day. It's just one of those things I'm itching to find out about. Yeah, me too. There's so many possibilities. The tunnels could just be some secret way through the wall. I feel like the wall is going to come down, and that's how the, the undead's going to get through it. But I don't, you know... What do I know? These it's up to George. You know, these are all valid possibilities in my mind. So, my theory is just a theory, just like Joe's. I like it. I like hearing these alternate theories, and I'm very confused as to what Gorn's way may really indicate as, as far as foreshadowing, if anything. But it's usually something. George doesn't usually throw in random world building. That's the one thing I always come back to. Just because I don't know what it's pointing to doesn't mean it's nothing, because that's just not doesn't seem to be how George operates. So again, it's one of those cases where the absence of information actually makes us curious because there's probably something. <laughs> Nina says, both John and Bran think about sharing stars and specifically the constellation called the Ice Dragon with wildlings, right? Or, uh, yeah, so Osha was the one who told Bran to find his way north by looking to the eye of the Ice Dragon. So that's really neat that they have the same name for this constellation. And uh, so John in this chapter suggests, you know, makes that same reference. He points out the ice dragon when he's talking to Igrit. Nina says, speaking of stars, it's particularly interesting that the Sword of the Morning constellation is another one that both Free Folk and Westerosi proper share the name for. So, hmm. and that kind of makes sense because, you know, the Dawn is really, really old. Starfall is really, really old. So even though the this is so far away from Starfall and the Danes, well, we got 10,000 years for that story to spread around the realm and for it to become popular. So it's not at all a stretch. And there's a suggestion, Nina says, there's a suggestion that the Danes and Dawn played a key role in the original War for the Dawn. So it may have been uh, far north when that happened, or if not far north, at least it was wherever it happened. If Dawn, the sword, played a role, then that would be part of the historical memory. And uh, yeah, we'll see. John's question of whether Arya was ever really his sister. <laughs> That's a really big one, right? John thinks, is she still is she is she still my sister? Was she ever? <laughs> what a sneaky line. Nina thinks that might be some leftover stuff from the original plan to have the love triangle of, of John and Arya and Tyrion. But <laughs> she's he was never really her sister because he's not. <laughs> Ned's son so that's the that part we can be sure about I like Nina's idea but for sure it's a joke about John not really being a sh uh, Arya's sister but this realization could be what leads them to be in the original plan it, it could be why he's like oh maybe we can have a romantic relationship if we're only cousins and not <laughs> not brother sister yep 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 Archmaester Rennie also points out that with regards to Craster, what Egret says, he's more your kind than ours. Now, what she's saying is your kind, meaning crows, meaning because his father was a, a, a ranger. But a little obscure theory that I definitely think is possible. What if Craster's father is Blood Raven? And that could be a sneaky, he's more your kind than ours, meaning Targaryen. Because if Craster has one quarter... Uh, he has, you know, half half of Blood Raven's Targaryen half, which would be one quarter of Aegon the Unworthy's <laughs> descent. Then, well, 
it would certainly at least give thematic resonance to Craster being an incest guy. Uh, and the timeline, I think, works because Bloodraven was Lord Commander on the wall until about 252, and Craster's old enough, I think, for that to fit. So, seems like it. So it could be a sneaky reference to Craster actually sharing the same blood as John, more your kind than ours. Hmm. I like it. I like it. That's a good theory. Definitely can't say, at least nothing I'm aware of, uh, eliminates that theory from contention or possibility. Right on. Also, a super chat from Jeff Gustafson, 999. Love your content. Ashea is the best. Yes, she is. Thank you very much, Jeff. Much appreciated. And that covers us for John 3. Let us wrap things up today with Daenerys 3. The gang burns some slavers, a.k.a. the one where a dragon is no slave. The first line is... All... The slave girl sounded wary. Given what she's going to do, yes, absolutely. It must be all. The one she doesn't take will be ordered to defend against the one she does take. So she realizes that any Unsullied that she doesn't buy is going to be killed. So she really doesn't want that to happen. She's already kind of aware, or she should be aware, that even though this is probably the right thing to do, almost certainly the right thing to do, there's consequences and collateral damage. It's almost impossible to undo this. Not almost impossible. It is impossible. I'll go that far. It is impossible to to destroy the slaving industry without killing a few innocents. I just don't see how that's possible. They're so powerful, so entrenched. So that is another reason it's such a difficult moral conundrum for us as readers to find our moral bearings and, and for Danny herself as a character in the story to know what's the right thing. And she is so young and has so little life experience. Well, she has a lot more life experience than most people her age, but still it's, a, it's amazing how right she is about so much without having uh, a lot of the experience. She's just a natural at so much. If we return to the, to Astapor's hell metaphor, then what we have here is Danny out burning hell. Yeah. Dragon flame burns hotter, and so does she. She's determined. She's clever. The slavers are so greedy and so arrogant to... Even they can't perceive her as a threat. The, heck, they hardly perceive anything as a threat. They've been so unthreatened by anything around them that they've just... I don't know. It's like the dodo birds on Madagascar, I think it was. They went extinct because they were at the top of the food chain. They never evolved to be afraid of any other species and so when human beings just started popping up all over the place they didn't run away they didn't know they had no instinct to run away because there was they hadn't developed fear of those beings so yeah that's kind of these slavers they have forgotten to be afraid of pretty much anything and that's why they're constantly looking down on her and they look on any they look down on pretty much everything and anyone that isn't them. It's a very pervasive attitude. So they don't even notice when she starts shouting in the language she pretended not to know. She's yelling, "You are mine. It is done. The the text in the books are all capital. You are all the dragons now." But only one of the slavers notices this because they're just so so <laughs> detached. Here's a great little quote. Silver, gold, or plain, he cared nothing for the fringe. Strong Belwas had his Arak out as well, and he spun it as he charged. Yeah, so all that placing themselves above everybody, all their little internal hierarchy, silver, gold, plain, pearl, fringed, does not matter. You get no special privileges when it comes down to this. And that is a very poignant little statement about how it all comes crashing down. This is where we have to point out that Astapor is not made up of only slaves and slavers. And this is what I was getting into at the beginning with the, the moral conundrums of where you draw the line. The idea that it should all be destroyed, meaning destroy the entire system, it's a general attitude I'm espousing, not necessarily a specific plan. Because as I've said, the slavers are irredeemable, and killing them, I think, is the only way. But I'm not sure about her edict that everyone over 12 is guilty. There is still a middle class of, of Astapor, and 
Some of them are probably irredeemable slave believers, but maybe not. But all of them. Yeah. But still, where do you judge? There's no book to read. There's no guidelines of how to undo thousands of years of slavery. What's the the best plan possible? Who knows? There's no way to know. That's the point here, that it's unknowable. There has to be mistakes made. You have to break some eggs here to free the innocent. It's 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 terrible to consider i mean how do you go about determining who's innocent and who must die how do you go putting yourself in that position there's no framework for perfect liberation right there's no way to be sure what actions should be taken but you can be sure that actions should be taken right that's the real conundrum and danny's the only person with the ability to take action here you know if it's me or you there you were like well, I'm powerless to stop this. I don't have the means to undo this. But Danny does, and she knows it. And knowing she knows it means she has to do it because that's the kind of person she is. She can't live with herself if she doesn't do her best here. And this is the same conundrum that exists in other places Danny will find herself like King's Landing. Except the conundrum will be more difficult because it's not going to be so blatantly in one direction it's not going to be oh my god all the rulers are slavers kill them all that's actually an easier decision than well not all the lords of uh, and ladies of westeros are evil you can't just wipe them out as a class some of them are pretty decent some of them are going to be on her side so this is like building up to a more difficult situation for her slavers bay it's hard to call it easy but the moral conundrum of it is easier than it'll be in, say, let's imagine Volantis. Let's say she goes to Volantis and there's a huge slave population there. Does she just kill all the nobility? Uh, well, no, probably not, because we see what happens to Astapor after she just burns it and leaves. She realizes that was not a good idea. She didn't know. This is where her inexperience comes in. But it's horrible. Burning the slavers and leaving... We pumped our fist. The TV version captured the epicness of it really well. But we, none of us were probably fully aware or even aware at all of the long-term outlook here. You can't just kill all the slavers and that's it. Society's fixed. The aftermath for, Aftermore, for Astapor in the short term is horrific. I think, I think there's a great potential for long-term Astapor to be a much better place. But again, the short term, oh, it's one of the worst things we've ever seen. Danny doesn't see it personally. She's only told about it. And so are we. But only several books later, again, we turn to Quentin Martell, who was there. Quote. The young Kai had sealed the broken gates to keep the dead and dying inside the city. But the sights that he had seen riding down those red brick streets would haunt Quentin Martell forever. A river choked with corpses, the priestess in her torn robes impaled upon a stake and attended by a cloud of glistening green flies. Dying men staggering through the streets, bloody and befouled. Children fighting over half-cooked puppies. The last free king of Astapor, screaming naked in the pit as he was set on by a score of starving dogs. And fires, fires everywhere. He could close his eyes and see them still. Flames whirling from brick pyramids larger than any castle he had ever seen. Plumes of greasy smoke coiling upward like great black snakes. It's almost like there's seven parts to this This. Uh, sentence too or this paragraph too the different descriptions there's almost like i think there's you could seem seemingly you could divide it into seven little chunks which is like what has been said seven hells this is so awful it's certainly not what danny had in mind but the uh, general idea here might be simple and telling danny tries to do good and she does kill a lot of extremely awful people but Unfortunately, no one in Astapor knows how to rule because it's been entirely in the hands of the good masters for thousands of years. The middle and lower class and freed slaves need to figure out how to do that. They need to come up with a new government. You know, maybe I don't know about a constitution that would be helpful, but some sort of charter, some sort of way forward. But it's also this giant power vacuum killing all the wealth and power and knocking out the people that held that. A lot of people are rushing in to take that. So 
there's as much of a, a power and wealth as there are up for grabs. There's this wealth of blood to match it. And that's why she doesn't make the mistake again. When it comes to Maureen, she stays. She learns that tearing down the system isn't enough. It has to be rebuilt. You can't just blow it up and leave. From this, and her wondering what to do with the Unsullied when it's all over, thinking ahead, thinking about justice, thinking, you know, ruler must do justice, things like that. It's so hard to imagine Danny just blowing up King's Landing because she gets mad. It's, this is everything we, okay. When we were, re, during Valar Aridus, when we were looking at the early stuff, Danny and the Dithraki see in the path of destruction behind her and how she always arrives in new places unspoiled. There was a lot of destructive imagery there and of her leaving a trail of blood behind her. And that's still there to some extent, but it's been modified by all this constant attitude of Danny's being positive and, and forward thinking and good. And so it's really, really difficult to see how we get to something like the show's ending for her. So again, it seems like that something like the show's ending is going to be pretty damn different. I think for some characters, it's going to be pretty similar. But the farther we get in this reread, the more I just scratch my head about this is not pointing to vengeful, destructive Danny. Not completely. It does point to that in some ways. But in other ways, it points to noble, progressive ruler Danny. And I really wonder where in between the truth is going to fall. Whew. Quace. She's a very huge yet very short part of this chapter. It's only a few paragraphs. Danny is first confused as to how she got past her guards and handmaids without waking anyone. Well, that seems to be because she's in her dreams or maybe a glass candle. More on that in a second. Let's get to what she says first. Quote. Remember, to go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward, you must go back. And to touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. So we've been saying for a while. When can, George wait, real, can we can we picture her saying it like patch face? <laughs> you know, sing songy. <laughs> to go north, you must go south. I know. Oh, oh, oh. To reach the west, you must go east. Oh, oh, well, oh. Not just like patch face. Come on. Have some originality, Aziz. <laughs> okay, I'll come up with something. Give me yeah. time. I to can't go do north, it on the fly here. You must here. journey south. Ouch, ouch. I don't know. Something. Ouch, ouch. <laughs> so yeah i've been saying for a long time if george repeats something to the readers take note he wants you to take note that's why it's in there twice or more this is perhaps even stronger because it's not just repeated for the reader quite's prophecy but it's repeated to danny and she says remember to go north you want to go? it's like a very distinct reminder and it's just like this like i said it's just a few paragraphs it's like quite jumping in like don't forget and it's interesting it's particularly interesting because it comes as she's asleep the night before making this big move against the slavers. So is, has she not fully made her decision about what to do in the slave market the next day? And Quaith is like pushing her in that direction or is Quaith maybe telling her, Hey, you're off track here. You're not going, you're not, I mean, this isn't the right direction for you to be going. You, this is, this is off of your goal. And I don't know about that because it seems like the Unsullied are awfully important in the long run, especially because we see them fight the undead. But uh, yeah, so it's it's very tricky. This is one that we it's hard to get your bearings on. Um, learning about the East before going West, that makes sense to me. I mean, there are mysteries in her past and her family's past and her ancestors' past are, well, they're kind of to the East if you look at Ashai, but to the West, Valyria is to the West of Slaver's Bay. So yeah, yeah okay, still, but... The Ashai stuff predates the Valyria stuff. So it does work that way. To go east, you must go west. It still fits. Especially pertaining dragons and prophecy, right? After all, dragons are supposedly originated well before Valyria and farther to the east. And definitely the prophecy of Azor Ahai, which seems to be Danny, originated in the east. Far before even Valyria existed. So that absolutely fits very well if she you know needs to track down that mystery and how it applies to her because of course remember we all as far as we've gotten in the books danny does not know she's a zora high that is a show thing that 
probably will happen in the books, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. She hasn't, at no point has she thought of herself as a Zora High, although she has thought of herself as a child of destiny, as a, you know, some sort of version of a prophesied hero, etc. But just without these specifics. And I can also understand to go forward, you must go back. That's a similar concept. To, to, in, to, in order to understand the future, you have to understand the past. So that, that seems to line up very well. To go north, you must go south. Well, to go north, it sounds like fighting the others. But why does she need to go south first? What's going on there? To unite the realm? To get Dawn? To get information at the Citadel? I don't know. That one's a little trickier. Bo all of that, maybe? Let's recall that a central piece of the Azor Ahai legend is uniting the peoples of the world to face the Great Darkness, right? It's not just that Azor Ahai is a warrior. In fact, Azor Ahai is rarely referred to as a warrior. It's not never, but Azor Ahai is usually referred to as a leader and that capacity in which that capacity is as a uniter, bringing together disparate peoples to fight this common enemy, this greater threat. And John, quite honestly has those qualities as well uniting the wildlings uniting the north you know uniting the, the night's watch perhaps uniting perhaps rob's old kingdom arguably danny will do more of that especially if she brings john onto her side eventually but mm, that's maybe why there's multiple azora high legends out there because multiple people are going to be great uniters even if one of them kind of outshines the rest that doesn't mean the others don't play a role so uh not only does this come this dream of Quaith, this, you know, implanted dream, perhaps uh, come right before she makes her move against the slavers. It comes after she's been dreaming of crossing the trident. So it, it, the order is crossing the trident dream, Quaith coming in, and then Danny wakes up and goes and does her stuff with the slavers. Now, here's that quote. That night, she dreamt that she was Rhaegar riding to the trident, but she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurpal <laughs> usurpals, <laughs> usurpals. <laughs> when she saw the usurpers' rebel host across the river, they were armed all in ice. But she bathed them in dragon fire, and they melted away like dew and turned the trident into a torrent. Some small part of her knew that she was dreaming, but another part exulted. Yeah, I wonder if the other part is the part that sees the future. I don't know. The parts, the part that knows this is actually coming. Maybe the part that. Quaith is influencing? I don't know. So crossing the trident is very much like crossing the Rubicon, which was, which that's a reference to Julius Caesar. When he crossed the Rubicon, it was officially entering Roman territory with an, with an army, which is illegal. So he had basically become a traitor, but he was making his move to be named as dictator for life, etc. Uh, so he, you know, it's the old phrase, the die is cast. So Danny is, is in a similar situation, not only in that dream, it's kind of familiar in that concept that she's crossing the trident to make this move against uh, the others. But she sort of crosses the Rubicon, so to speak, when she commits to this engagement against the slavers. Uh, yeah. So which of this was sent by Quaith? Did Quaith send this part of the dream? Did she send this Rhaegar writing to the trident? Is that part of her influence or is that just mixed together all in this same evening of dreaming? <laughs> Hard to say. And, of course, how did Quaith send the dream, regardless of how much of it she sent? I think that's pretty straightforward as far as what, we're, what we know about the lore in this situation. It seems very likely a glass candle is involved. I mean, there's obviously other potential magic that we don't have a name for that could explain it, but we, we know for sure that glass candles can do this. At least we've been told they can. So it fits super well. All right, a couple thoughts from Joe. He's betting, uh, you know, er, interesting, great take here. Barristan tries to stop Daenerys from from trading her dragon away. And he points out that he bets Barristan never told Aerys that kings can make mistakes. Because <laughs> she says, well, even queens can err. The Astapori have cheated you, your grace. <laughs> but, you know, it's not that Joe is saying that Barristan is being sexist here, although it might be. That might be what's happening. It's it's it could be just that she's young and he's looking down on her because she's she's young like that. But it might also be that Barristan doesn't want to keep quiet about things that he kept quiet about under Ares. He may feel guilty about not speaking up. In fact, that is a theme of his chapters later. He and we even referenced one of those things uh, in Brand's chapter when we talked about how he regrets not speaking to Ashara Dane. 
Um, it reflects on the master's opinions towards themselves and what a slave is worth as a person and that they just throw Masande into the agreement as an afterthought. I mean, she's really impressive. She has all these great skills of learning languages. Like, how many languages does she know already? Something, yeah. something crazy by age 10? I mean, they're just like, yeah, take her. <laughs> like, what? That is just... It's just another example of just how far gone these people are. They can just throw in a human life as part of a barter. Like, wow. I mean, I mean, good for Danny cause, and good for Masande. Like, whew, as an afterthought, you escaped continuing to have to work for those guys. How small does that make somebody feel? I mean, geez. Remembering how young Masande is, it's difficult to see how she doesn't completely celebrate her freedom either she is way mature beyond her years because she knows that hey she's not going to celebrate being sold from one person to another because she doesn't know i mean she maybe have a she might have a sense of danny being better but what did we say at the beginning of danny too this is a place that destroys hope so she's not going to be like this might be better that's the kind of thought that burns you in a place like this no you hold back your hopes. You've been taught to restrain yourself because it results in disappointment because there is no hope in a place like this. So she's not going to, on the outside, for us, it looks like this is a much better situation. In fact, we know it is. But you, we don't have Missandei's perspective of being a person that has had all hope eradicated from her and that she's going to have to relearn that by being with Daenerys. And, but... There's at least some humanity here. She's not totally just holding herself back. She's still human, and she starts sharing things with Daenerys right away because she does at least sense... Maybe she does have some hope. And she trusts Daenerys with the information that some of her brothers are among the Unsullied. And this is a, amongst... This this conversation happens when Masande admits that, yeah, if you tell them to murder themselves after they're done being an army for you, they'll do it. Uh, and Danny's like, wait, but you don't want me to do that, do you? And she's like, no, you know, some of them are my brothers. But she also says, kind of, they're not my brothers anymore. She doesn't say that, but she says they're not men anymore, which is sort of the same thing. But she still feels for them, etc. The old mantra of, if I look back, I'm lost. Danny told herself the next morning as she entered Astapor through the harbor gates. Joe says, welcome back, Danny Mantra. It's been used six times in Game of Thrones, and it comes back here after not occurring in Clash of Kings. And it's going to be popping up five times in A Dance with Dragons. So very interesting. And, of course, it's uh, thematically important for her. We, we talked about how big that, that is in terms of her not looking at the destruction she's wrought behind her. She does look back here. She sees what she did to Astapor, and that's why she stays in Marine. But I don't know that it's making her lost. So you, you got to take that statement a couple of different ways. There's a supernatural element to it, perhaps, but there's also a kind of a rah rah, this is how you got to, this is your the winning attitude type thing. But there's some strong side effects to that. Eri and Jiki release Viserion and Rhaegal during the, you know, brouhaha, and we instantly see how they can turn the tide of battle even without having, you know, even without being fully grown dragons, they can do a whole lot. Just the, just the confusion and chaos they cause. The cavalry are freaking out because the horses are like, ah, dragons, flaming beast, whatever. And, uh, yeah, just, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very small window into what the dragons are going to do when they're, oops, when they're full grown and uh, unleashed against a real army. I just smacked the microphone with my hand. <laughs> Some thoughts from Nina. Danny's choice of clothing in this chapter is meaningful. I definitely didn't catch this myself, but Nina was on top of it. As she negotiates with the slavers to buy the Unsullied, she wears a Carthine gown. It's explicitly designed to be seductive. She wants to distract the slavers to keep them from noticing the clues to her real plan, her offer to sell her ships, despite clearly needing them to get to Westeros, her determination to buy all the Unsullied, her refusal to leave even the boys in training in the, on the table. There's so many clues that they're going to be betrayed. But they, of course, they, they don't even pay attention when she's yelling in their language. So they're definitely not going to notice these clues, which are more subtle. 
So Nina points out when she goes to make the actual purchase, she's dressed like a call. <laughs> so instead of a Carthine gown, she's dressed like a warlord. And it really reflects what she's about to do in both cases. In one, she's like negotiation, you know, bringing down the barriers here. She's like, I'm coming for you <laughs> and you are going to die. That's a great catch. I did not catch that at all. And of course, we can't miss that Danny thinks of Eroa in these chapters, the one who kind of exemplifies for her what the, the horrors that she had embroiled herself with, you know, asking Drogo to take the throne. Because the first thing he does is go out and create situations like this. Uh, you know, maybe not quite as bad, but basically as bad because they took a bunch of slaves and sold them to these people. A lot of the people they killed in those Lazarine villages where Miri Mazdor was probably would have ended up in the Unsullied training program. Hmm. Joe says, I don't, or rather, not Joe, but Nina says, I don't interpret Danny's dream to mean that the final battle with the others will literally be at the Trident. I more see it as Danny's paralleling herself with Rhaegar. Rhaegar's climactic moment himself was at the Trident, but he failed, as Jorah pointed out in the prior chapter, by the way. She will step into the same shoes Rhaegar once thought were his because he thought he was the prince that was promised, but really it's her. And he thought he was going to gain victory over the others. Eventually, she's going to do it for real, but not necessarily here at the Trident. The dream setting also works more immediately in the narrative to contrast Jorah's quote from the end of last chapter, Rhaegar fought nobly, etc. Because Jorah wanted Danny to believe she couldn't have it all, victory and nobility. But we've shown that's not necessarily the truth at all. By stating that Rhaegar fell to try that, she's saying, look, you just have to do this the dirty way. But we know that that is not true. Jorah just, maybe he's just not imaginative enough, but more I think it's just because he's just, well, not that great of a guy. <laughs> Barrison advises Danny that Aegon the Conqueror proved the worth of dragons at the Field of Fire. And just like we were just talking about, Nina made a similar catch that releasing all three of the dragons in this scene is reminiscent of the Field of Fire, not just because of the chaos and because of what might be coming later, but because it's the only time in history that Aegon unleashed all three of his dragons at one time. And so, well, Danny did that much earlier in her career. <laughs> Maybe that's a way of saying she's ahead of even her famous ancestor's uh, path. All right, some questions and comments from y'all, starting off with Catherine Hansen first, Seth. Sends, is that Nor Norwegian? That apple with coffee uh, gif there? Yeah, I think that is Norwegian. Thanks for that. Sir Newt of the Rock points out that the concept of blood, uh, bricks and blood, is similar to blood and fire. Because the bricks are red and the bricks are super, super hot here because of the sun. And, well, yeah, that certainly works. Nice. Paul Barry, patron, points out, does Grolio have the roughest story arc in all of A Song of Ice and Fire? I mean, it's just all losses for him. First he loses his cabin. Then he loses the whole ships entirely. Then he gets you know, loses his freedom because he's sent to be a hostage. And then he's the hostage that gets murdered. That's a good point, Paul. Poor Grolio. Thanks for shouting out Grolio there, because sometimes this, these side characters don't get noticed, and a lot of times the, these side characters have bad things happen to them. Because, hey, it's it's not good things happening on the fringes and the margins here to most of these characters, not at this time, anyway. So, again, just as I've been going off on in these chapters about the difficulty in seeing Danny going dark, there is evidence for it later. Uh, some of the same things that corrupt the slavers maybe start to get to her a little bit. You know, she tortures, she, she advocates torturing a, a young girl. She, uh, and a lot of this, she does this after having a temper. Um, she, you know, impales all these great masters, uh, makes them suffer, etc. It's, it's, some of the signs maybe come later. So it's, maybe this is where it's the hardest to see, but that, might balance itself out later when we see signs of, well, yeah, I could see her getting more brutal and things like that. You know, war does that to people, going through bloody sieges and tortures and seeing what people are capable of. It might dampen some of her, you know, optimism and dampen some of her nobility and some of her good spirit. We'll see. 
The way Krasny's Monoclos dies. Is anyone else reminded of Raiders of the Lost Ark with like fa literal face melting, his eyes melting and all that? That's what I thought of. <laughs> Nina with a great catch. This is very casually where we learn what Valar Morgulis means. Like, oh yeah, this is where it is. It's just casually translated here. You know, it's something we all take for granted because good Lord, they say it on TV a lot. <laughs> and just in, not just on TV, but it was a, a common line for, for fans to say. Like, I like saying it. We say Valar, heck, we call this Valar Reredus. That's, <laughs> it's, it's in line with that. But I never thought to note when we actually got that translation. And apparently it's right here. So nice job. Stefan B., uh, also uh, notes that in addition to kind of crossing the Rubicon, we've also got this jumping in the pyre moment. Danny's crossing of the Rubicon is she it can also be likened to her crossing the line of flame in her first, uh, in, well, her last chapter of her first book where she walks into the fire. Here she's walking into the fray, so to speak, but in a sense, this is easier <laughs> than, you know, walking into an actual roaring inferno. A couple people pointed out that Danny, even though she frees Missandei, she kind of immediately starts giving her orders, which is, you know, it's it's a little awkward. Over, I mean, it's not like a, no one's saying that Danny's bad for this. It's just interesting to note the nuance of what power does to you and saying, you know, hey, I did this great favor for you. You, you know, I'm going to tell you what to do a little bit. On the other hand, like, Danny knows that Masande is just going to not walk off and be like, actually, I'm out. I'm just going to leave. So see you later. Because as we've already pointed out, where? Where is she going to go? She's got no money. She's got nothing. So Danny is her only choice at this point. A final comment of the episode comes from Stephanie the Peerless. Really good one. One of the great masters, uh, good masters rather. I think even Krasnus Monoklas, but it doesn't matter. One of them says, you're going to want to... Blood those unsullied right away. Get them into a fight immediately if you can. <laughs> Whoops. I don't think they had that version of immediately in mind, but that's what they got. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Well done, George R. Martin. Good catch, Stephanie the Peerless. And we move to our outro. Last week we covered 141 minutes and 30 seconds of the audiobook. This week it's 182 minutes and 15 seconds. As always, I... Relate how much we've gotten through in audiobook terms, not because it's the best way to get through the books, just because all the different versions of the books are different in terms of how many pages they have. The audiobooks are sort of a unified number. So far, we've covered 973 minutes and 4 seconds out of the 2,853 minutes and 37 seconds of A Storm of Swords, so we're a little bit past the one-quarter mark. I'm sorry, one-third mark. A little bit past the one-third mark, yeah. You can check the video length which would be probably about two hours, 35 minutes-ish to check how much was removed, edited out for the podcast version. Currently, it is two hours, 38 minutes, and 12 seconds. Cool. Next time, another batch of five chapters. We return mostly to the Riverlands, Crownlands, King's Landing area, but we've also got a John chapter. Sansa 3, the one where Joff wants to be like Aegon the Unworthy, a.k.a. Surprise, you're married. Arya 5, story time, a battle of the bells, a.k.a. the gang captures the hound. John 4, the gang climbs the wall, a.k.a. the one where Val becomes single, or surprise, you're single. <laughs> Jamie 4, the one with Fapire... <laughs> Thapirth. <laughs> I just wanted to say that a few times. The one with Thapirth, <laughs> aka Kyburn Stump Service. <laughs> Kyburn Stump Service. And finally, Tyrion Four, the one with Ice Reforged, aka the gang makes singers stew. Thanks to everyone who came and participated in the live chat, made the recording even more fun than it would be otherwise and added your comments and questions and live thoughts, some of which made it into the episode. Ashea is the best, I'm working so many things at once, as always, and it is impossible to imagine doing this without her. Thanks to Joe Buckley and Nina Friel for adding their wonderful, well-formed thoughts to this document. As always, you can check out Joe on the Isle of Faces podcast and Nina on goodqueenally.tumblr.com. Once again, Allie with one L. 
Thank you to our History of Westeros mods. Y'all do a wonderful job posting the chapters on schedule every week, leading the discussions. Every week I check those threads and find something, if not several somethings, to add to the episodes. Same goes for Flick. You guys really knock it out of the park over on Flick and bring some of our most, some of, some of you guys are just, every episode I feel like I quote y'all. And like I said, our Slack and Discord channels are just getting going. We only launched those within the last few months. Great thoughts are coming from those as well, too. Flat out discussions are happening, back and forth, long chats, really good stuff happening. Thanks also to Michael Klarfeld, a.k.a. Clara Dox, the man who makes our maps. He did our video intro, and he found us the music from a man called Kevin McLeod, who we use as well. And he's currently working on The Reach. Yeah, he is. That's Michael Klarfeld working on a yet another regional map for Westeros. That's what he does, y'all. We're terrible. We still haven't put up his other regional maps behind us. I know. We, we have just Iron love these Islands so much. and Dorn. <laughs> I know. We need to move these. One day, we're going to just do it all at once and just put up several maps. What we want to do, by the way, everyone, is we want to attach our maps to a nice, like, hard bit of cardboard or something. And add Velcro on the back so we can just pick it up and move it like we have for one of them. This one already is like that. As you can see anyone on video yeah. watching or you can hear me. Otherwise, yeah. it just peels right off. So we got to do that for some of these other ones. Yeah, and then we can have different ones depending on the episode. Yeah. It's a goal. It's a it goal. A goal. <laughs> Thanks also to our Benjineer for the audio editing assistance. And thank you very much, last but not least, to all of our patrons, anyone who has liked and shared and subscribed and left comments on iTunes. All these things really do matter. They really add up and they really do help us do what we do and do it more thoroughly, do it more often, and do it with more happiness and excitement. I had to say something there. I kind of talked myself into a corner there. That was like a Michael Scott moment where you, know, you start talking and you don't know where it's going to end up, but you just have to find it along the way. That's exactly one of his lines. He's like, sometimes I just yeah. start a sentence and I don't know where I'm going, but I just find my way. He's like, that, sometimes yes. you don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Same here. Sometimes That's you every I don't. day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just keep going until I find something that makes sense. <laughs> or doesn't. Or doesn't, yeah. Or I find a joke. Maybe I can find a pun to distract from the awkwardness of what just came out of my mouth. If I can make people forget by doing something more awkward, but at least <laughs> funny. Yeah, that's my style. So thanks again to all of our patrons to make it all possible and everyone else who is, has, has uh, helped in a variety of other ways. We certainly appreciate you. And hey, this one was, was one of the longer ones. But hey, that's that happens sometimes. Danny just getting to Slaver's Bay and lots of other cool stuff. So we'll be back next time with more Valar Reredus.